Hi, this is the, the Heart to Chart Share, and we're here with many distinguished and master charters, and just so pleased that we could have this group assembled together to go over what everyone's style is related to the chart. We've just been encountering so many charts with so many people, and everyone has something to bring to the table, and I'm just so privileged to be here with everyone. Uh, our our, our the way we're going to run things today is everyone's going to have a chance to present a chart, four to five minutes or so, followed by some questions. Uh, and we're going to try and keep this in two hours, but we all like to talk and we all <laughs> like to ask questions. So we're going to do our best to, to keep it moving for you. To start us off today is uh, Elizabeth Houghton. Hey, oh, I hope I can do this. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Jonathan. I play from start. Pardon? Play from start. Oh, play from start. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to start off by why I really love the love, trust, and use the standard acceleration chart. I consider the standard acceleration chart a gold nugget to me. I grew up in the gold country of California, and finding a gold nugget it was very important. And um, I really can trust the chart to help me make decisions, to individualize, to personalize um, what my students are doing and to make better decisions. I also really like it that during the school year, it only takes two charts because changing charts to a whole bunch of pinpoints. So I appreciate that it only takes two charts to do the whole year. And I just wanted to say to anyone, this looks complicated when you first see this chart, but believe me, if you break it into achievable chunks, I've taught second graders to chart. It did take time. They did have to practice. I, again, I had to use achievable chunks, just knowing the, saying the eight days of the week forward and back and charting between one and 10 and especially 10 and 20. But little young children can you learn to use this chart fluently. So it's, it's, it's usable and it helps you learn so many things. Like for example, if you ask people, they'll say Friday kids don't perform as well. I never found that in the learning charts, but I did find that Halloween is the event that affects kids so much with all that sugar, the charts, you know, but I could see over Christmas vacation, what levels the children retained and what, it's just so many patterns of learning. So I'm really proud to use the standard acceleration chart. I also wanted to just talk a moment about the comfort of children when they first, or anyone starting to do timings and, um, in the beginning, I always make sure to build the students' strengths, things they can do so they get used to doing timings, they're relaxed, and you can tell. But in my classroom, uh, in the beginning of using precision teaching, when we didn't have all these electronic timers and things, the kids took turns timing and they'd write on the board the time they started and then the, the sweep hand would go all the way around for a minute and they'd say, course begin they would go start go and it it always bothered me certain ones kind of jar everyone like go you know and as my friend Kent Johnson said it's the pace it's not a race and so after talking with Eric somewhat about this we decided to begin to use please begin and I just want to say it's a wonderful way for children to learn and what happened to that was so amazing is at conference time, I had all these parents telling me, you're teaching my kid manners. And I'm going, I'm not teaching. I wonder what they're talking about. And it wasn't just one parent. It was a whole bunch. And I talked to my principal about it. And he said, well, I've been in your room. There's so many please begins and thank you very much. The kids are picking up on that. So sort of a side benefit of using please begin at times um, is that kids really do pick up on using it and improve their manners. Now the chart that I want to share today, oh, what happened? Oh, there we go. Is a CSA words oral reading. And this is a student Riley, he's in third grade. And here he is reading at, uh, now, uh, two aspects I want to stress with this. One is 
We've worked on all kinds of foundation tool component skills, his phonemic awareness, his word calling, his vowels, consonants, all these things were lacking in the beginning. And we were reading passages at that time, but not focusing on it as much. Now you can see here where he's in the beginning stages, it's taking him, and this is like two times the timing happened twice each day. I see him twice a week after school. And uh, he had quite a few errors and it took him about four times. And then one, this one time it took him eight times before he got up to his aim, which was 120 a minute. So one minute timing. So I talked to him. First thing he told me is I hate reading. And I said, well, why do you hate reading? He said, because the teacher calls on me in class and I can't read the book. So he really was nervous and had lacked, really lacked confidence in his reading. So I said, why? He said, there's so many words. So I said, let's take a smaller amount. We'll read the whole story after, but we'll just decide wherever the period is, somewhere between 50 and 60 words, we'll start doing that. And right away, he started, you know, making his aim. And then we changed his aim. He said, I can read more words. And I said, fine. So we changed his aim to 130. You can see along here. And then we changed it to 150. And he was a little nervous about that. And it took him a couple of times to pass each time. But his air stayed pretty low. And then once he got confident with, with that, I said, OK, let's take on the whole story again. Let's read the whole story and see if you can do it. He said, I can do it, I can do it. And sure enough, if he did it twice, uh, he was able to make his aim, which was 150, and that continued for a while. And then we moved into the next level, second grade reading. And at this point, I did make two changes. I started doing a 10 second, because that was one thing that Eric Houghton always stressed to me, is make sure that they're reading uh, in the range that you want them to be all the time, if it's possible at all, so they get the rhythm, so they get the pace. You can see here in the beginning, it took him a few timings, three, and then two to pass, and he went right along and kept passing, and pretty soon he was passing at 150 uh, at, at the first try. So now I'll take any questions that you have. That's a cool chart. Elizabeth, tell me why you uh, like or picked read, read Naturally. I use Read Naturally quite a bit because I like the stories. I like the comp. Uh, I make sure they do a pre-tell and a retell too. But uh, the kids read books a lot at school, and I find that these stories are, are really pretty good. The kids like them. Okay. So I do use that series quite a bit. Okay. Elizabeth, is the um, asterisk on the at the top line in that last panel? Is that your ten second? Yes, that's scene? right. Okay. That's the ten second. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and so was that done as kind of a warm up? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Great. Yeah. And then the first dot is always the cold read. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Elizabeth. Yes. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. Are you doing this paper pencil or on the computer? The read naturally. Oh no, it's paper pencil. You mean charting it, Ellie? No. Yeah. Oh no, girl, I'm right there with you. I do paper pencil charting. Um, no, I know that read naturally has a computer program, but that you can also print off the stories. So are yes. you? Yeah. No, I have all the stories. I bought them a long time ago when you came with CDs. And I still use them. I, I have never used their online program. I, I tend to use regular reading from a book or from a passage. Yeah, I have the CDs too. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Elizabeth, the, the P notation at the bottom, is that indicating that each read is a different passage within the that's right. curriculum? Yes, that's right. It, it, all these, are, each day it's a new passage because we, like I said, we do preview and retell and right. they do the question. So I 
I believe that's why I start back at a lower level. I want them to read the passage if possible every day. Yeah, that's great. Now, Elizabeth, on subsequent timings within a day, is that the same passage or would that be a different passage? No, that's the same passage. Good question. Okay. That's three repeats here where you see there's three dots. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the same place in the passage? Do you move the, the next timing is later in the passage than the no, first timing? No, I, no, okay. I don't. Can't. Good question. Reading. So repeated reading then. It's repeated reading. That's why I like the first dot knowing the cold read. Okay. Sometimes I keep a cold read chart and a repeated reading chart if a student is going to be repeating a lot. And I might use a timing chart too for their repeats. All right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it... Stop sharing. There you there. go. That was awesome. Thanks. Great questions. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Ferris, you're up. Hello. Um, I did not make slides, but I do have a chart. Yeah. Um, I picked the question of why I like the chart. I'm like, well, we probably should all speak to. And I think mine is about falling in love with discovery. Um, I think my comfort of coming into precision teaching was actually about not necessarily knowing what I was going to do, but finding the chart as a tool to informing that process and kind of just falling in love with that, um, that I didn't have to know the aim. I didn't have to know if I had designed it perfectly from the beginning, but that I was going to get that information that I needed to make those adjustments. So I think my, my comfort and I think my joy is just getting started and letting the learner and the chart refine the process. Um, and so I p actually picked a chart. I looked at all the questions and I, and I think I did, I purposely did not pick a behavior that lived in the minute world. So I picked, um, one of the things I really like about is the chart family. Um, when I watched Clay's presentation, one of the things he talked about was that, you know, on the, on one chart, we can look at the whole range of human behavior. And then with the whole chart family, we can look at behaviors that happen um, that live in different time worlds. So this is one that's um, close to home, actually. So this is um, my girl um, at seven. And this is a nice example of like, just how we can pinpoint. Um, you know, sometimes we pinpoint where if I look at self-care that it might have been actually about the sequence of toothbrushing, but in this case, it was about initiating and taking responsibility um, for that repertoire. And the reason it's on there, that this is a split chart. So this is a little bit of a window into how I kind of like to do chart gymnastics and why I'm pretty committed to paper because I can do that. Um, so on the right says brave moment. Part of this came from, thankfully, I have a very rich, like, supportive parenting community. Um, we had some medical refusals, and um, they were required have to medical procedures. So I reached out to some friends and just said, okay, <laughs> help me. Um, I'm obviously going down a, like, urgent parent path that's cultivating a lot of coercion, um, and my girl is me, so um, she's really good at holding her ground. Um, so I need a new, I need a new path. So we paused, waiting a few weeks um, wasn't going to be a big problem. So we started this idea. Actually, I have to credit Shane Isley um, for helping me pinpoint the concept of brave moments. And so the dots on the right side of the chart were moving forward and persisting under, from her perspective, less ideal circumstances. And so I purposely targeted this as a really large class. So this did not have to include medical things. So you can see some of the things that happened. It happened to be January in mm -hmm. Seattle. We went snow sledding. Um, and so for my very cautious, low risk tolerance um, person, snow sledding was had the thrill, but it also had some of that risk in it. And she actually crashed. That's one of the things. Um, and stood up with a huge grin and did three more runs down this hill. So those were some huge, awesome moments. Um, 
So the prescription was that Vince and I were going to look as parents to cultivate at least three opportunities a week. Um, and then we were doing a cumulative line with an eye towards let this be a robust building experience so that we can move back towards um, that medical piece. So it's a little bit of pulling in kind of a constructionist view of not being linear about that particular appointment, but that building this repertoire of bravery that life asks us to do things under imperfect situations or in, you know, discomfort. Um, and so this big star was having that doctor procedure. So that was a huge accomplishment um, for both of us, <laughs> for all of us. And really this chart has led, I think more globally, we were able to stop the chart, but it has led to how we have conversations around vaccines, immunizations, anything. Um, even that eight is a little bit of like, it's my body, I make the rules. Um, and that's really great. I worked really hard to cultivate that. Um, and so Tris, the chart really helped us discover and guide me as a parent how to have that conversation and also get her what she needs. So I take questions. Yeah, go ahead, Al. Uh, how are we doing questions? Are we just raising our hand? Are we just yeah. yelling? I would just uh, it out. start yelling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Kelly, first of all, you're brilliant. Um, second of all, Shane's you, idea. <laughs> well, brilliant via Shane. Do do you have your husband charting as well, or is this like a family chart that everybody can enter data on? It was a family chart. It's a, you know it's a little bit old now. Um, it was it was a family chart. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And she 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 would report like. I think this is one of my dots. And she was also very honest. Like, it will be an X on my chart. Like, I'm not moved. This is not my persist. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, she's, the self-awareness is, is really great. Yeah. Kelly, this is a, a personally motivated question, but uh, I was watching some videos last night of a hike that I might be doing in Zion National Park in a few weeks. And with my fear of heights, I told Donnie, I was like, I don't think I can do that part. Could you start this intervention with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really, I think you know, the other thing that it taught me, and so sometimes, you know, you get really close. So I think the other piece maybe that I could point out about this is, you know, looking at the supervisor, advisor, manager, that when you buy into precision teaching, kind of Jonathan, how you open, like it really does become a huge community. And it was like, you know, I had numerous options of like emails or texts or calls to who I was going to reach out to, to help advise. And anyone who's not in that parent arrangement sees a thousand more possibilities and potentials. You know, Shane's like, you know, you have to cancel tomorrow's appointment that you have. Like, that's not the one you're keeping. And I was like, that didn't even occur to me. I'm like, we have to be ready for tomorrow. Um, so I do think that this like rich community of advisors and coaches, um, it comes with being a chart user. And I, and I think that's part of it. You don't have to know all the answers. That's such a great point, Kelly. That's Which is so good when you're a parent, because I really don't. <laughs> well, yeah, I've come to you for many things along those lines as well. I think one thing that I, I notice on the perspective of being a parent is the beauty of talking about it as an X or a dot. I think that when you can talk about it as an X or a dot on your chart, it pulls away some of the nagging or the blame, or a lot of those rabbit holes that's so easy to go down as a parent when you're talking about some of those behaviors, when you're trying to shape behaviors of your child. And you know that you don't want to go down there, but it's, it's, it's a slippery slope. But when you can just talk about it, because you've already set those pinpoints, right? You all have already said, like, our X's are this, our dots are this and you've given your child that language, then you can talk about the X's and dots and removing any of that just weighted language about yeah. should and, you know, all of that other stuff that gets kind of messy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just really love 
I love that. And then that just became really apparent to me when you were saying like, oh, that's going to be a next for me. And I bet you that was like a lot easier for her to come and say to you as opposed to, to like maybe some other language or I don't know that she could have, she, she may have used it in, in the absence of this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this is just another chart that just shows the incredible diversity, right? And the flexibility of the chart between Elizabeth and what you just showed Kelly, the range of things that you can keep capture on the chart. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. Uh, this is perfect. Thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing this. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say thank you too, because sometimes I feel like in our field we get too operationalized, and I like that you have brave, brave moments up there, and we all can tell what that is. You don't have to operationalize it. So that's <laughs> that's what I just learned from this chart that you just shared, and I, I welcome other charts to this capacity too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Confession: I definitely don't live in the research world, um, and I would say I think Kent's a little bit through trying to learn agility and understand that pinpointing at a much larger like class composite world actually gives you a lot of flexibility and because I live in the applied world and obviously this was really applied um, it's it's easy to use that language because I actually want it to kind of be permeable I don't want it to have really tight lines um, yeah. so yeah terrific thank you very much uh, next up, Jason. Hi, everybody. Uh, I mean, I'm going to do my best to follow uh, Elizabeth and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and Kelly here. Um, uh, I wish I could have gone first. Um, all right. So um, uh, I'll start in with why I love the chart. You're in the club, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. You're in the club. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm going to start why I love the chart. Um, you know, I like the chart for all the things that a lot of you guys do. I like the standardization. I like, you know, the, the ease of use and everything. What for, for, I'll talk more like from like a specific thing for my needs as a leader in the organization that I'm in. Um, Kathy Fox and I at Hogland, we, you know, we oversee five schools with, uh, in, in four different cities with uh, 320 plus students and 160 staff-ish. Um, and we have to... Um, get precision teaching going with all this. And on top of all this, we run on a shoestring budget where we don't have the ability to, you know, pay people a ton of money. And so we end up with a lot of, you know, people that are professionally uh, naive or new to the, you know, just to the workforce. Um, we end up with folks that are, um, that aren't traditional teachers or don't have any training in this field whatsoever. Um, at best, if we're lucky, we get somebody that wants to go to school and like become a BCBA or do something like that, you know, but, but they're not, they're at the beginning of that journey, not, not the end. And once they reach the end of that, they go somewhere where they get paid more money. And so um, the, a, a, a challenge for us is how do we, how do we get all these people up and going with, on top of this, we get the kids that nobody else wants. We get all the kids that all the other school districts have said we can't handle and we don't, you know, here's, here's some money, please take them away from us. And so, how do we make all this work? And so um, what I love about the chart is that it is so easy to teach somebody, are, are, is it, are they above the line or are they below the line? If they're below the line, what do I do? Right. Um, and you can give them some basic tools and you can get people up and going. And then it's also easy for us to kind of check in on all the kids regularly and get a, a, a really nice quick snapshot of how all the kids are doing quickly and easily. And then we can devote our, coaching resources to the people that, that need it. Um, Cause if we ran around trying to, you know, give equal time to every single teacher all the time, we wouldn't have enough time to do it. And so we've got to be, we got to be surgical in the way that we pick our spots. So um, I'll just share my screen on a couple of things. One, um, you know, we start with all these, these job aids. This is just, you know, not a chart to share yet, but we, we, what I like about the chart though, is it lends itself to us being able to have these like very, very simple decision-making tools with the learning pictures or like, you know, Deb Brown has this, this thing she brought us years ago with the fluency decision on stop, keep going, get help. And not only can our teachers learn this, but our kids can learn this stuff. And so we can turn a lot of people that aren't charters into relatively competent charters in a very short amount of time. And so we like, we like that um, a lot. Then um, we can 
have somebody that's, that's also not a, not a big time charter quickly check in on all the kids charts, I'll follow a very base, basic rubric. Um, hey, these are the people that have kids below the line. These are the people that are up to date with their data. These are the people that have, uh, that are, are labeling their interventions correctly. These are the people that aren't. And from there, we can get a quick, just by looking at all the different colors on this little blurred out thing to, for, uh, to hide the kids' names, I can go in and I can see these are the kids that are struggling. These are the classes that are struggling or these are the groups that are struggling. And so from there, we can go in and we can, we can coach um, the staff as, as, you know, where they need it on what they need. And so the chart makes it really, really easy to do that on this grand scale that we're trying to pull this off on. And so that's why um, I really like the chart. Um, for pinpoints that we typically use, we are using, you name it, we've got them all. Uh, we're pulling everything that, that Morningside has ever shared with us. We're using all of their fluency. We're, um, we're searching through the back of Rick's book for ideas and stuff that we can do. We are um, inspired by like, like Andrew Drew Bulla, you know, with, with your stuff. I remember you talking about the duck walk or the, the, the guy with the, the, he was working on the walk thing. I see that type of stuff and I'm like, oh, that's, that's inspiring on what we can do with our other kids on their working on their gates and different things for, for gross motor skills. So we've got pinpoints for everything because we work with kids that are typical IQs all the way to kids that are like severely affected. Um, uh, lots and lots of hurdles in their, their learning. And so that's, those are the pinpoints we use. And then I was going to share one chart here real quick. Um, I kind of liked this question, uh, number four on the list of how we use record floors. I feel like that's one you don't really see a lot. At least I feel like when I see shares, I don't see a lot of people sharing, you know, cool uses of like a record floor to, to get where you're going. But this is a chart on this teacher that we were coaching up um, for a student that showed up that was, we were told, this student can't even sit in a seat for more than three seconds. And if he can't sit in a seat for three seconds, you can't teach him anything. And so it's just a lost cause. And, you know, we, had, we coached the teacher up and we said, well, you know, three seconds fits on the chart, right? And so he figured out that this student um, could do, you know, so it, well, this is a math facts chart, you know, the goal being let's get 60 math facts done in a minute. And uh, he could see that this student could do three math facts in three seconds, but after that, he could do like five or six or 10 math facts, and that was it. So he started his floor at three seconds and then just continually um, dropped the, the, the floor each day um, or every couple days, uh, building the student's um, endurance in their seat to be on task during these math facts. And from there, you know, he started, you know, crushing it and hitting all these goals and stuff. And if I could, you know, this is a screenshot, but you know, on Chartlytics, you can obviously scroll across the, if you were to continue to the right of this chart, you would see the student continue to hit more and more goals. But I just thought this was a really neat use of it. This is a student that had the, the pace, but only for a very, very short amount of time. And uh, I thought it was a fun example of using record floors and how we do it to work with our students to, um, to coax out these little flashes of moments that we have with them. So that's my, uh, that's my share. Any questions? Great, great job. So I've got a comment, which is that we've been talking about sprints for years, but those are the shortest sprints I've ever seen. And it's really cool, the three-second thing. I think, I mean, I don't know, has anybody else done that? I, you may have the record for shortest <laughs> interval, and it's beautiful. It's really Back nice. Back in the day, Kendra and I had a table. We would shape up one second at a time. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. One we second. We started at three. That, that, may be a, that may be a shorter starting spot than what we did. I think we may, we may have started at five. But. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've done lots of 10 seconds, but three yeah. is... Three. I really should credit Rick and Chartlytics with this because, you know... <laughs> the, on the paper, it's hard. <laughs> the, the math, three seconds on the, on, the, on the paper is hard. Well, that's why we would have a table because right. all of our, our, you know, instructors would get really grumpy about charting right. with those variable floors because they're like, oh, that's so much math. You oh know? yeah, God forbid <laughs> even 45 seconds back in the day because then it was like, oh, oh yeah. that's a hard yeah. problem to do in my head. That's way harder yeah. than 30 seconds. Exactly. Yeah. Multiply by 1.33, what are you yeah, saying? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's been a, 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 a great tool for that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know really... Scott Bourne does that a lot uh, in Kansas. Uh, he does variable floors all the time. One thing that I love about that, you know, when we think about shaping, we tend to think about kind of shaping some, you know, 
topography of behavior to uh, to a terminal goal, but you know, looking at actually shaping endurance yeah. um, is just really, really cool and uh, something that I think we don't see quite enough of. Yeah, like, really. Yeah, really. Yeah, awesome. We've got all the charts that do the acceleration and that type of stuff too. I just when I saw yeah. floors on here. I thought, oh, that's a cool one to talk about. Yeah. I know yeah. just uh, great. That was a great idea. Yeah, yes, that's totally awesome. Good. I like your phrase. Jason, I had a question. I like about your, phrase. your acceleration names. Oh, sorry, Ken. Okay. Go ahead. How did those impact your uh, decision making? So, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Rick. Can you say that again? Yeah, I was, say, I was asking about the acceleration names you shared. How did that impact your decision making? Well, I'm sorry. I guess I don't understand. What do you mean on how we the like what the what the aim is like how that. Well, no, didn't it, weren't those purple lines, acceleration lines on your chart? Oh, yes. So in this case, they were already at, he was already at the aim for the rate. And so we weren't really looking at those acceleration lines in, in this okay. particular case. Um, you know, that's the situation where, you know, he could do three and three seconds, which is the pace we're looking for. That's 60 per minute. And so at that point, we're, we're more interested in like, we were just looking at like, can we, can we keep him at that level while dropping the floor? Right, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Kent, were you going to say? Yeah, I wanted to hear Kent's expression that he liked. Oh, I liked your, I liked your phrase, coax the brilliant moment. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you know, these things go by, it's in a flash. And so I, I'm going to remember that um, next time I watch an online class. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about how I was going to say that for a minute. <laughs> Jason, thank you so much for that chart. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good job. Kendra. You're yeah. Right. Um, okay. So I do have a slide, but before I go there, I'm just going to talk for a second. So, um, I mean, it's, I can't really come up with a reason why I like the standard acceleration chart, but uh, one of the things that Kelly said earlier that I really appreciated is, um, it allows you to fall in love with discovery. And that's one of the things that I really try to share whenever I have the opportunity to teach a class about the standard acceleration chart is about, you know, for a field that relies on visual inspection of data, um, the tool that we're using to analyze the phenomenon of interest really matters. And one of the things that I chose today, um, and I have three charts, so we'll see if I get through that in my five minutes, but uh, it affords an analysis of variables that might be on the periphery of the treatment setting that might influence treatment outcomes or other behaviors of interest. And so um, because of the synchronization of it, you can glean functional relationships between setting events or interventions that might be removed in time or not contiguous with other behaviors that we're measuring and evaluating. And so it's like visual analysis on steroids because you can also uh, quantify the amount of behavior change. And so that's kind of the um, overview of why I like the chart. But let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, this chart is uh, actually a case study that we published. And um, this one I really, really like because we had a student for whom we had been working with for months and months. This is a weekly chart and it's showing the student's performance on a, uh, a progress monitoring tool that requires the student to engage for eight minutes. And uh, one of the things that is, uh, this student had a diagnosis of ADHD, and oftentimes when kids are put on medication, physicians and parents can rely only on subjective information about the impact of that medication on learning. And we were actually able to quantify, and it's not a causal relationship, but it's, it's interesting. And so we were actually able to quantify the amount of variability that we saw in the frequency of corrects um, for this particular student by using a measure of bounce. So, you know, following the addition of the uh, ADHD medication, we saw that the variability decreased. Now, when we published this, we had really awesome editors and they said, okay, well, what can that show you that you can't see on a line graph? 
Well, this is, these are those same data on a line graph with percent correct. And you can obviously see an increase in percent correct, but what you can't see is a decrease in the variability by using a measure of frequency and the ability to quantify that change in behavior on the standard acceleration chart. So we were actually able to give the physician and the parents some information about changes that we saw quantifiable objective changes in behavior that occurred in an academic setting, right? So um, another example of this, uh, not of that in particular, but sort of this zoomed out contextual analysis that is afforded um, with the standard acceleration chart. So this is a student who, um, that we uh, have the opportunity of working with. And um, this little learner had some problems with um, uh, goal failure. So if a goal wasn't achieved, then often we would see instances of work refusal. And so this is a session floor of 50 minutes. So we're actually observing that's the duration of a session at FIT. And essentially we are um, using a session floor and recording the frequency of personal best or aims achieved during that session. And the red dot reflects a session with work refusal. That first phase change line is when we actually put in an ACT intervention. Now, the ACT intervention, we did uh, mindfulness and diffusion, specifically error diffusion. So we just had this learner on a skill that was really accurate. We gave the rule of instead of saying what you know it is, tell us something different than that. And then reinforce forced high rates of engaging in errors and persisting with that. And we actually see a decrease in the frequency of sessions with work refusal after that particular intervention. And then we can also see the effects of that intervention on good student behaviors that occur throughout the session and any prompts for things like good learner position. So those X's would reflect uh, prompts needed for good sitting. And then after that ACT intervention, which was like 15 seconds of deep breathing throughout the session and that error diffusion, we can see a functional relationship between those things and other behaviors of interest throughout the session. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I really like the chart. You can zoom out and you can look at the influence of other variables on behaviors of interest that, you know, I mean, it's easy to see if I'm trying to work on letter sounds and I slice back on letter sounds, the impact on letter sounds, but to see the impact of something like teaching a student how to engage in some deep breathing or uh, creating a history of reinforcement for, uh, for persisting in the, in the uh, face of making, having a learning opportunity or not meeting a goal. Um, to be able to zoom out and use the standardized nature of this chart and the date synchronization to evaluate uh, relationships among variables like that, uh, I think is one of the coolest um, features of the chart. Kendra, what I love so much about using the chart in this way is that your consumer, like the, the parent or the student themselves, it's like a quality of life picture. And so it, that's more along the lines of social validity, which we don't necessarily measure specifically social validity, but these are ways to say, you know, look how we can use the chart to, to, um, to model collaboration with outside service providers like doctors. And, you know, many times doctors don't want to collaborate with people who are not medical professionals. But if we say, what are the behaviors you're looking for that are impacted by this medication? Can we just give you information and you do with it as you please? But yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's being a collaborator amongst non-precision teaching interventionists, but using the chart as the common tool. Um, I, I say kudos to you. Awesome. Thank you. Hey. It's a, a, a comment, I don't know, a theme, and maybe it's a question more for the whole group or just a rhetorical question of, I do think, you know, I'm not a line chart, like add, subtract advocate, but there is potential in that arrangement for people to glean student unhappiness um, and non-participation. You know, you don't need a standard acceleration chart to measure session refusal. But there seems to be something to me that for people who use the chart, the proclivity towards doing something with that information or positioning ourselves to ask that question, look for the data and make changes in response to that, 
to that information. I don't know if that's a correlation. I don't know if there's a complementary reinforcer set that tends to select that along, but Elizabeth opened with, you know, that her learner was picking his aims and then deciding when he was ready to, you know, as Gog said, like gobble up more instruction and move from 120 to 130 and higher. And you were positioning yourself to look at session refusal and how you can shape and change that. And this summer we did math talks at my house and my girl decided double goal days, which was she didn't want it to go up every day. And so it was a little bit of an act component. Okay. And then sure enough, it did actually go up every day. But the feeling that two days in a row, it was going to be the same mattered. Um, so I just, I don't know, a common theme I think across all of those is that everyone positioning themselves to hear information from the learner. So I just said, they were all learning the thing that was being pinpointed, but also a how component, how they were learning it. Isn't it true? That's a really cool insight, I think. And isn't it cool that if you kind of go back and say, well, this is about inductive discovery. And, you know, if you go back to the science of it and the discovery is, it's, there's natural consequences in there. So we do it and then we learn stuff and then it leads to something. That's what's so beautiful about the whole thing. It's not just applying recipes. Like every time you learn something about that kid or that behavior, whatever. And I think that that's the contingency we want to put people in touch with if we're trying to get them to chart, you know, Absolutely. that's great. That's a really nice insight. And the, and the, you know, the, uh, the, the problem in ADHD uh, can, we have so much to potentially offer that community. I, I remember in the nineties when I thought that's where the direction I was going into starting an ADHD clinic and using chart data to look at key variables like variability. That's really important. There's such a proliferation of psychotropic medications out there. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, most doctors and families in an inquiry would, would wind up saying is that variability is the problem. And so, you know, the fact that you can show the different variability mm -hmm. functions um, as a function of different drugs is really important. So when you're trying to make decisions about wh how much of a dose, you know, and which one and all this crap, um, I think the chart can really uh, help people make those uh, decisions. So I like, mm -hmm. I like that look at variability that way. So, uh, and you can't see it under other metrics. So I think that's a really important point too. We, we use um, variability a lot. When, you know, I was saying we, we look at all these charts all the time, you know, trying to figure out where to go help. And variability on any pinpoint can often tell us a lot about what's happening with the classroom management for that teacher. And so oh, being yeah. able to have that as like a, 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 a thing, okay, it's, it's a, a meta analysis, if you will, of being able to say, okay, I can look beyond what we are actually measuring here. Now I know who's got classroom management under control, who doesn't, who needs help. It's also a really useful tool there. You know, that was an original prompt for me and Denise Van Eyck or whoever it was in the early seventies to look at endurance too, because we saw this incredible variability from day to day. And we just made, went from like a minute to 15 seconds. And all of a sudden the thing tightened up and it was like, Oh, you know, and then we started looking at that whole endurance and sprints thing. So it's a big deal. I think underused, yeah. you know. I agree. I agree. So Thank good. you so much for you that. You talk to neuropsychologists at all? Do you, do you, you know, we have a few in town that we've sold the chart on who will ask us chart about chart data. Absolutely. Um, that's right. our, probably our primary referral source in Reno. Um, but uh, yeah, she is um, so sold on how we measure and analyze performance. The, you know, I mean, she's probably one of the most articulate individuals on how we differ from other approaches like Orton Gillingham or the Barton method or uh, right, and why she would refer students to have uh, more of a precision teaching intervention than one of those more exposure based uh, interventions. So that's been an important community for us to connect with in, yeah. in Reno and, and now in Portland. Yeah, really important. Okay, Thank cool. you, Kendra. That was a terrific display. Thank um, you. Next up, Andrew. All right. Um, so everyone's been hitting on why the chart's important to them. And I decided to sh show a personal project um, and of a lesson that I learned this year from working with Abigail on the special issue. 
And the lesson that she taught me is that we, this chart is standardized, but you also make the chart work for you. Um, so I'm going to show you all a little bit of how I taught myself to juggle. And full disclosure, there's going to be shirtless pictures of me in here. It's, just, it's, it's going to happen. There might be a video with some swear words that we have to pause the recording because I'm not sure I want that to be recorded, but it shows the joy. So this is how I taught myself to juggle. So why did I teach myself to juggle? Well, I'm not sure if you all are aware. <laughs> These little things, uh, this is COVID-19 and came up and halted my, my ear. And as someone who just turned 30, I was having my third life crisis of, I'm starting off my 30s in quarantine. So what did I want to do? Well, I had to avoid being around COVID because these were people that were getting sick and people that were dying. And we were talking about the data and looking at the data on the chart, but those red dots represented someone's mom or dad or brother or sibling or loved one. And, you know, I took it very serious that my body could potentially be a weapon and could hurt someone. So I took quarantine very seriously. Um, now, some good habits came about this. I had some time with my parents after I tested negative to see them. I went surfing. Ooh, went some paddling all by myself. What, oh, look, at played some guitar in my free time. But then there were some not so good habits too, like um, drinking this tequila. <laughs> um, that was a great time. Or eating carbs, lots of carbs. I fell right into the, just keep eating carbs. Like, I'm not kidding, a lot of carbs were consumed <laughs> during quarantine. Um, and the potential for sedentary behavior, right? When you have a cute little pup like that who doesn't want you to leave his side, you're gonna be a little bit more sedentary than you should. So I decided to teach myself to play soccer, um, in, in particular, how to juggle. So I did a component composite analysis of juggling um, in alignment with a, a, my subject matter expert was uh, one of my buddies, Kenneth. He played, uh, he played soccer for all of his life. So he helped me do this analysis of what are the component and tool repertoires that we need to get juggling to emerge? Because I didn't want to practice juggling. I wanted, I wanted that to come for free or with as little instruction as possible. So I worked on um, building my component skills. So I practiced these component skills and then I would just uh, freely juggle for 30 minutes after I practice all these component skills for at least five minutes. So left and right foot single touches, left and right foot double touches. So uh, two hits with each foot then alternating thigh touches with the ball. So practicing bouncing the ball back and forth between my thighs, alternating foot touches. So rather than just keep hitting with the same foot, I explicitly practice just going back and forth with each other and then being able to pop the ball up from the ground. Now, soccer is rhythmic and playing the drums was a good way to build in that rhythm to soccer. But a tool skill of this was a toe touches with your uh, toes on the top of the ball and getting into your rhythm of how you want the ball to go. So I worked on that in building and finding my rhythm. So I made the chart work for me and I did, um, I looked at it three different ways. So I did variable timings where the best um, chain of performance with consecutive hits, I video recorded everything. So the longest chain of hits uh, within that video recorded session, I then would chart those data as a frequency. So with floors as short as four seconds, um, and I would just count up how many. So um, I looked at that, and then I also charted the, the um, best frequency of the day as a count up. So I, I used the um, 0.001 line as a one per day, and just, you know, just used it to make that work for me. But what I, what I like about these data, and you all can see, it, is that after acquisition, it was what we were just talking about which when Jason presented about it was endurance training. I needed to, to shape up that endurance. I needed to get longer and longer because the frequency should be about 100 to 120 uh, touches. That's the frequency I want to stay at, but I want to see those floors moving down that chart. I want to see those floors drop and drop and drop in and maintaining that same frequency because when the frequencies dropped, the topography of the behavior got bigger. My legs were higher, right? I wasn't keeping the ball nice and controlled. So I wanted my frequency to stay the same per minute, but I wanted my floors to drop. So I calculated, and many thanks to uh, Carrie and Kendra and Clay uh, Starland, I was like, can I calculate these uh, acceleration values on floors? Like, it, it feels weird calling it a divide because it's getting longer, but it's moving down the chart. So we did. That's what, when they said, yep, yeah, let's do it. So, um, I treated the floors as they were a measure of duration and looked at 
um, how that was growing across time. And I took a break because I was working with Kent Johnson at Morningside Summer Institute. <laughs> the Summer Institute. So I took a little break because we, he'll tell you, we were, we were cooking, we were working up a storm. Um, but I, I was, it was interesting to see um, how, how the time was growing. And I don't know, I just really like this chart because it's my own performance. And sometimes when I, when I work with kids, I forget how cool it is to hit a goal and the, the, the really automatic and natural reinforcers built in with that. Um, but I wanna show you, so here's me shirtless. I wanna show you what these data points represent because again, the frequencies may not be changing much, but there was so much about the topography and the form of the behavior. So this was day one. So again, there's a little bit of carb gut going on there, so no judgment. Okay, so not a fluent performance, like big kicks, right? I don't know what I'm doing. My dog's even, he's running away from me. Um, but what we have here is um, uh, the last day, well, this was actually Tuesday of this week. So I hit my personal best of 47 hits. Um, and it was, I don't know, just take a look at the difference in performance. Don't mind my noodle arms. That's what happens when you're lanky, y'all. And you can see when I lose my rhythm. There was, that was <laughs> my best one. I do a little dance. But it was so cool that, oops. That, that was a result of not practicing at the composite level, right? I wasn't practicing juggling and nicely. I was working on the component skills to get growth on the composite level without having to target that. I was just measuring the composite. I, now, I didn't measure the component skills. It was just too much measurement and try to juggle your ball, uh, a soccer ball, not like that. Anyway, um, so I just want to see, but I was able to make decisions then based on the data. So take a look at this video, and you can see that I was right foot dependent. Boy, was that tripping me up. I was super right foot dependent and I was looking like a clown. Ready? Oh, you uh -huh. Oh, no. Okay. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, going back. And it, it messed me up. It really messed me up. So I, I saw that video and I said, okay, the frequencies are the same, but I'm not, I'm not using both legs. So I doubled up on component pro practice of alternating foots or foot touches. So um, this, again, is a collective of people that knew how to play soccer, and they taught me. So many thanks to my buddy Kenneth, who literally did tag teaching to get the, the correct form down, um, and my, my colleague Sarah, who's socially distanced, also helped. But I want to show, I don't know if I'm allowed to show it. I curse in this video. I say the F word a couple of times. So if you want to pause the recording, <laughs> every time a learner hits a goal now, that's how I'm going to picture them, because I could feel what it, what it felt like. And I haven't had that for a while. So that's what, it, that's what it taught me. And I made the chart work for me. And that's how I taught myself how to juggle. That's my chart. And Andrew, I mean, motor is near and dear to my heart, right? And the, the fact that we're landing on, this is what I've been finding too across thousands of charts related to motor, is that it is about building the endurance. And it is about maintaining that stable performance at an aim as you move through the timing tools, right? And that's clear and clear. And, and I really appreciate that composite you know, analysis, right? Because you could really see that uh, as a coach working with kids for lacrosse for years, that's exactly how we tackled it. We worked on the tool skills related to lacrosse and we just practiced on those, right? And then you found that they applied it in the games as a part of the broader composite task, working mm -hmm. their way to state champs, right? Yeah. Just by working on tool skills. And mm -hmm. that's just, it's, it's so overlooked, but so, so essential. When I come yeah. to members, so yeah. thank you so much for presenting yeah. that. There's, an, there's another really cool thing that you use the word rhythm. And um, Eric Houghton used to talk a lot about rhythm. And, and he was, you know, in a whole lot of context because he also liked music and all that. But it's interesting in physical skills. I have a, a kind of a relatively new colleague, um, Jamon Willis, who's a behavior analyst in Texas. But he also played in the Rose Bowl and was an NFL football player. And we were talking the other day about rhythm in football. And, you know, I'm used to looking at it in soccer because it's a beauty. It's kind of a beautiful thing when you look at soccer. And you think about all the different sports 
and they have different rhythms like basketball. You watch, you watch Michael Jordan move down, a, you know, through some people and stuff. And I never thought about it, but what, um, what Jamon was talking about is when you got a team of football players, what happens during preseason, for example, when they're getting their act together for the first time is they develop a rhythm of working together. And I really think that there's a lot of the stuff that teachers, precision teachers, and, and, and that those of us know about frequency, I think that word is important for talking to average people. And also probably Jonathan, probably all you guys are aware of it as part of what you're looking for, right? It's not just a frequency. It's actually a regular frequency, like you were saying. So I, so that's, I, I think it's cool to use that word, I guess, is what I was thinking. You know, so, Carl, I, um, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's important even in academic skill building, because you will get, uh, you know, have a learner who presents with, uh, I don't know, we always talk about it as a burst and pause. And yeah. so they might hit the frequency, but we actually had, um, we did a, a Call, old colleague of, or he's a colleague of mine, but he used to work with us at FIT. Uh, Ken Killingsworth actually did a second by second analysis of frequency on a CSA RAM task for one of our coaches and one of our students. And we were able to look at, you know, our coach was just steady at 100 yeah. responses per minute. And you just see these dips with the student where he's hitting that frequency drops, hits it, drops, hits it, drops. And mm -hmm. so that's not fluent performance uh, right. if it's not a steady rhythm. And so, you know, even inside of academic skill building, that's so relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's cool to, I believe he actually ended up doing his uh, dissertation um, on that. And there's a follow-up thesis coming out of uh, UNR furthering that analysis. So uh, hopefully those will end up in print at some point. We, 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 we do the same thing at, at Hogland. We, we, we'll do timing splits and we'll look at like 15 second segments mm -hmm. of, of where they are over the course of a minute or two minutes. And we can really do a lot to find the types of interventions that are necessary to help you. You can glean so much, whether it's a, an endurance issue, a warm up issue, uh, all sorts of other uh, things. If there's one particular tool skill that's in the, the set of things you're practicing that they're maybe getting stuck on. So I've put in blank. So I took uh, Elizabeth's snake and based on the rhythm that the, the learner was doing, we actually put in deliberate like blank cards as a breathe card, kind of like in music, like at the stanza That's and then cool. actually used that to shape. Yeah. So extending the rhythm, like they were doing two and then a breath and two and then a breath. The breath was actually more about like, think time and latency of the next picture but when we put it in and kind of controlled for it it smoothed things really out fun. so that was that worked out really well and and I learned that you don't just juggle with your hands so thank you for that I kept I was like wow he is going component scale like starting with his um, so uh, I had some big aha moments <laughs> That concept of rhythm is so is so important in teacher training too. So, yeah. uh, in fact, I use I you know people laugh, but I always ask uh, people I'm interviewing for a, for teaching positions. I always ask them if they like to dance, and uh, to talk a little bit more about that because uh, you know it's so much easier to train a teacher who's got the rhythm. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. I have my, I'll have teachers practice uh, signaling for direct instruction. Uh, yeah purposes uh i talk about a, a what my walk-in closet i remember when i when i was learning uh signaling and direct instruction and i had a i had a walk-in closet with a long mirror at the end and i would stand there and do that uh you know ready yeah. boom snap you know yeah. and i had this down to like this this dance step <laughs> and i remember <laughs> and i remember engelman showing me a dance step like that he was developing this downbeat thing uh, just to help teachers become better at their job. You know, Eric used to say all the time to me, is, teaching is like singing and dancing in the classroom. So, you know, <laughs> it was, uh, it's can't really we talk about your ready, boom, step it every year when you're training with staff. I say, Kent gets up and he like does the whole thing. I'm like, I'm not going to do that, but that's what you guys should do. Does it have a bend and a snap to it too? <laughs> oh yeah, it says a whole, there's a whole. Uh... <laughs> I know we're running a little long on the discussion here. Can I ask a question on this real quick? I, yeah, yeah. I'm really curious. So Drew, you you did the, the 
for lack of a better word right now, like the celebration change, I guess, on the floors, yeah, kind of. Sure. Like, yeah. That is something that we've tinkered with. And I, to be quite frank, I've always been kind of just a little uh, too scared to bring it up or say, does anybody else do this weird yeah. thing? Yeah. But we, we've yeah. often said, oh, wow, it's like a, it's like a, a divide by two on that floor. And that's really exciting. Like, is that something yeah. that other people have tinkered with? Or is there stuff out there on that? Yeah, I use that all the time. And that's that's how I make a lot of decisions for exercise routines. Yep. We, we, I think we used because it was yeah. like, what's the goal of the intervention? It's to have those floors dropping. So I used it to make decisions because that's what it allowed me to do. And I was really, that's why I asked, I was like, thank God I'm on the board of directors for the SCS so I can tap into resources. And I was like, y'all, does this look right? Am I going to look like, like a, a, I don't know, someone who doesn't know what they're doing, but I needed, I needed to see this to make decisions. And I don't know, everyone said go for it. So that's what I did. I, I think it's a teaching moment for newbies because if you recognize that duration is just the frequency of one, basically, then it's not like some new place where we're applying it. It's just, we're looking at the frequency of one decelerating or accelerating, whatever it is. All right, this, this may, cause Drew, I, had, I shared your anxiety on asking about this. Is this, is this too weird? But this, this is one, if I take away anything from day, this is the best thing I'm getting. So thank you. That is the best thing news I've heard. Thanks, man. <laughs> So, Drew, that was really good to uh, take that to extreme, you know, our advice about work the components and forget about the composites, you know. Uh, you just took it right to the extreme, like, with a rule, like, do not do the composite. <laughs> you know, and that's so hard to keep people from being more naturalistic like that. They, everybody wants to try the composite, right? And you just didn't. And I think it would be interesting to see, uh, us to, to look at some, some data on um, – uh, you know, efficiency and effectiveness of teaching when you just mm -hmm. kind of leave the composite out versus doing some composite and then, compo you know, just what's the, you know, to, to nod to Erickson, you know, how much time does it take to become an expert, you know, mm -hmm. under these various conditions of component work and composite work, so. Yeah, it was well, interesting. It was, um, the composite got me frustrated <laughs> like trying to juggle from the start yeah, it was hard good. yeah it didn't feel yeah. good no so let me let, like i would work out for an hour and a half and between 20 and 30 minutes was just the composite because you do need to get into the rhythm of that, that that chain of responses but that's not where i practiced that was just let's see what happens right yeah. I, I went and practiced those individuals yeah, i got that i got it that's yeah. really good so that's really yeah. good that. Two other two other examples of that. There's a there's a uh, Ray Charles thing that I used to do a lot, a little uh, audio thing about him. And they said, "What do you practice? You practice the things you'd be playing in the stage." He says, "No, I just practice on the components." And that's one thing. But uh, as we have applied um, build, frequency building in customer service and sales, we never even practice the composites. We just identify the critical uh, components. And you crank those things up and these guys can do whatever they need to do in their sales call or their whatever. And we don't even measure that. And it's, you know, we don't have deficits and we got, you know, regular adults who can celebrate times three and all that without a lot of weird interventions. But, you know, if you think about it in a lot of things, sports and music, uh, like my son was a kind of a professional drummer and I watched him over 10 years become that. They just work on the components, right? And then you play the song and it all comes together and you practice it a little bit, but it's, I think that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Carl, Sometimes the song comes together. You got to practice the song. I was well, you do, but for it's... many years, you know that so, I competed. So, you still got to practice the song. So, yes, but, but yeah. called, there's a thing called song pra There's a thing called song playing. All right. So if we could get fuzzy right. about composites, which are fuzzy. So you got this song playing, right? And so if you have played songs, you know, over time, then you probably don't need to deal with the composite at all. But if song playing, like if the component ha bears no resemblance to any repertoire that you have, then you're gonna need to have some composite work. But otherwise you can just leave it out like these salespeople Carl's talking about, you could, I mean, they know how to talk to customers. I mean, they're in the jobs for God's sake. Uh, so that's not a necessary. Um, Good point. Another, I was actually, person, oh. another person would need who is learning how to do a sales pitch, you know, from scratch, and there's no other relevant or familiar uh, repertoire was going to need to put it all together. So I think that's interesting, too, to look at what's... Well, and how big of a composite, like we work yeah. from like fact level stuff 
up to. Respond to this question and be sure you make these three points in your own language at a comfortable pace, the way you talk about your favorite topic or whatever. And that's not a whole conversation, but they can put the pieces together. And now those, they don't have to do, a, like you say, they know how to sell, but we've gotten chunks. We built up to some chunks that work, you know. All right. I was just going to add, and then Jonathan, you can rein us in. Um, Adam Hockman's work with professional musicians is yes. pretty interesting because yeah. one of the things he talks about is they have such a masterful repertoire that they really do and can go at just composite practice. A uh, concert is coming up, and so they, what, seven days before the show, just practice the piece. Um, and when he can get them to groom down to having a practice schedule where they're working back on their tool skills, they're actually even more phenomenal musicians. So I think even with an impact professional fluent repertoire, that component skill work um, still serves uh, the performance. Yeah, that's right. Good point, Kelly. Yeah, thanks for that, Kelly. And, and one final note, just because it's so much motor, is that we've been working on tool skills for so long, just like the basics of wrist flexion and turning, right? And neck flexion and all these like joint ranges of motion. And we finally work on those. You get all of those composites for free, right? Yeah. Like washing yourself in the bathtub or shower. If you're working on the shoulder motions and the, and the elbow motions, you get all of that for free. It's really yeah. incredible how that works. And, and Andrew, your chart just displayed that beautifully. Yeah, um, and okay. my first big dive, I, the last, last little point, oh God, like, <laughs> can I stop talking? Um, it, it's even showed me though that learning is not a linear process and that when you're building muscle, you're gonna have off days. And it took me to discover that about my own performance that this one off day isn't predictive and I had to look at acceleration. I can't look at one single instance of performance because you're building muscle yeah. and it's gonna be sore. And you're not going to have the, that, that clean, perfect, you know, there's going to be off days. And that was another inductive thing that I learned is that you're building muscle. Look at the big picture. Stop being so bratty and looking at one free. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We, we went way over on that. Um, but next up is, is Allie. All right. So hold on a second. I still don't know how to share in Zoom very well. You share. You did a good job. You just so, did it. Uh, yeah, I know, but that was just one slide. Hold on a second. Yeah, there you go. It's not like I do this for a living or anything. <laughs> All right, you see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so um, one of the things I wanted to add to, to, to the end of that awesome discussion was that I really think that practitioners and people who either train others or who are working with novice learners really need to do a chart like what Andrew did because you recognizing that the off days and the all the, the social emotional uh, aspect of, of learning something new, if you could just put your, yourself in the position of like a 10 year old learning how to uh, read for the first time, I think that's one of the best things we can do. So anyway, so I can't do anything without a PowerPoint presentation. So that's why I did this way. And because I'm so rule governed, I made sure I listed all the questions and picked the two that I was supposed to because that's what Jonathan yeah. said. Um, and so just a, a little bit about like my passion and my, some of the highlights of the journey that I've had in precision teaching for the past 20 plus years has been the work that I've done with people living in different countries, typically uh, impoverished countries or countries that don't have a lot of resources. And also in what Jason was talking about, which is it basically you know, how do you manage hundreds of people, either young or old people at the same time? And you have to have some kind of like a, um, a unifying way to look at as many different uh, skills as possible simultaneously to figure out how to be uh, efficient about your time and energy. So one of the things, you know, marrying those two together is that I had the uh, great privilege of working with a young man that moved from Seattle to Africa. And I had to manage his precision teaching program from Seattle while he was in Africa. And so the way that I would do that is because I, I needed to track how he was doing in certain things that required physical materials, because it would take six to eight weeks sometimes for a curriculum to make it across the boat to Africa. And if the parent didn't have enough heads up or enough notice, they wouldn't be, he wouldn't be ready for the next set of materials. So this particular chart, I use weekly per week charts for this. And uh, sometimes you can do monthly per month, depending on the type of curriculum. But what I love about the chart 
and what it has afforded me in helping me be as efficient as possible as an interventionist is the versatility and usability of it. So I can progress monitor individual skills of students very easily, like what Kendra showed with the curriculum-based measurement charts on a weekly chart. But then I also need to track curricular progress. And there are a thousand different reasons why I need to track that. And a lot of it is the predictive value of, A, when am I going to have to get that next book to Africa? Or B, when is that IEP goal due? And I need to make sure I'm making those significant uh, jumps in curriculum to meet that IEP timeline. Um, and then also the usability of this. So this particular chart here is a weekly per week on uh, reasoning and writing progress. So the lessons completed is the dot and the parts of the lessons that are completed are the open triangle. So as you can see, you might not have a student progressing very quickly acceleration wise in lesson. And, and this is mastery of the lesson to, to be honest. And so we have our own mastery criterion and if the kid hit that mastery criterion, we counted it as a dot or a triangle. So the interesting part with this is that I would set, so if you see up at the top here, I would set the, uh, for the, the interventionist in Africa, I would say, I want you to be at this lesson by this date. And if you're not gonna be at that lesson by that date, we need to intervene much sooner. And in order to do that is because, the reason I wanted to do that was because the hearts right here are the trips that I took to Africa. So in February, I brought the materials over with me, and by my next trip in August or September, I needed them to be at a certain rate or a certain lesson so that I could bring the next set of materials. Um, and then again, I went, I was go, going about twice a year for three years. And then also this student would come back with his family to Seattle. So what you notice is that during the in Seattle time, which was like July or August of that particular year, I wasn't tracking this because we were doing lots of probing and lots of intervention with new curricula to make sure that they were actually going to go back to Africa in the fall with this reasoning and writing book. So this was super helpful for the family to know their timeline of providing materials. It was super helpful for me to make sure that the kid was making adequate progress. And it was helpful for me as the supervisor to know if I need to intervene from a staff training perspective because they're not making the progress. So the acceleration line on here is actually acceleration of the end point of where I needed them to be um, as far as lesson progression to keep them on the track of making annual progress, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now, you know, all of my Zooming that I've been doing, I have students that I'm doing the same thing, but it's via distance learning. So this particular student is a nine-year-old with autism who graduated from early intervention services. And so they were told that the kid no longer needed ABA because insurance has a pretty strict standard for what ABA is. Uh, and so this student was referred to me because he's nine years old and can't read. So I'm doing the same thing with his head sprout episodes. And it, the first part of this chart was June, July, August. I started with him over the summer and I just wanted to kind of see what his lesson progression would be. And then the first phase change line was when school started. And I am pretty confident that he, we have three one hour sessions a week. And so I need him to be making uh, progress in Head Sprout a minimum of three episodes a week. And the end goal there is after three episodes a week, when is he going to be at episode 100? And that looks like it's going to be about mid February. And because the student is in fourth grade and Head Sprout really is about a mid second grade level. I need to expedite him as fast as possible to get to the end of head sprout so I can keep him moving to get him up to grade level as fast as possible. And so I'm hoping to get him to the fourth grade level by the end of fourth grade. So I need to make sure that I'm staying on my curricular path to ensure that that's going to happen. Uh, and so I have my per week goal written up here and that's just the, the episode. I need him to be at this episode by the end of this week. And that's how I drew my acceleration line so that at, at a minimum or a maximum amount of time is that he's done with head sprout by the end of February. I'm hoping to do it sooner. At least that's my goal. Yeah. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Any questions? I just remember you presenting this years ago at the PT conference and have adopted it since. Uh, I know I know people get snarky about cumulative charts, but I love that like as a curriculum lover as well, it's like, yes, there's purpose for doing this. You know, it serves my purpose um, to track these uh, things, you know, and even if it's 
reporting to insurance company and I can say like, oh, they pass these many, uh, you know, programs within that window of the authorization or some, you know, whatever it is. Uh, I find this to be like really handy or, you know, if it's, uh, you know, cumulative steps in, in the curricular sequence, like you said, it's not even just maybe mastery of the program, but it's, it's like benchmarks, you know, measurable benchmarks of right. that curricular sequence. Uh, if, if that learner needs a smaller unit. Uh, so I, I thought this was genius way back then, and I still do. This is great. Yeah, yeah and you know, and I'm going to be 50 this year, and <laughs> I I don't, I'm not an audience for people telling me how to chart and what to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, thanks for letting me know. I'm going to keep yeah. on doing this. <laughs> well, and and most people have different opinions about that, but this has served me well for 20 years, and I have happy clients and consumers, and I'm going to get this kid who did not learn how to read until fourth grade and he will be on grade level by the end of the year i i have to guarantee that yeah well three cheers for that Allie. this is uh, really important you know curricular progress that's a tricky topic so uh, educators talk about it all you know when you get the intervention it's uh, educators on this on a roll with this topic they'll just talk about lesson per how much you know they'll just talk about unit time for teacher movement across curriculum they won't talk about the student performance within that so you have a nice dance here uh, that, that educators should see, you know, that curriculum progress is a function of learning, not <laughs> just yeah. teachers moving because the calendar page changed. So that's really, uh, that's a really uh, touchy business right now in education. So this is really important, uh, very timely, an important topic. So. Yeah, and I'm hoping my next phase change on this is going to be, you know, this particular student is in Seattle Public Schools and uh, up, you know, they basically gave up on him in second grade that he wasn't going to learn how to read. And so they just have been shoving sight words down his throat. And this poor kid has no fundamental uh, functional reading skills whatsoever because he was never asked to practice those. So my goal right now is to make nicey nice enough with the teacher, especially during distance learning. I can take a lot off our plate by saying, let me, let me provide the sight words. Let me provide the stories. Let me provide the, the comprehension activities. And I'll make them up based on what he's mastered already in Head Sprout so that she can then feel like she's making progress in his IEP goal, even though all the materials are, are functionally provided by me. And um, the nice thing about Head Sprout, too, is that I can then turn around and show them his data and his progress. And it's something that we can unify against versus me saying, I hate your curriculum and then saying, you're a crackhead. Like whatever this this disparity is between us trying to intervene within a public school setting, I'm just trying really hard to put as many systems in place to show that this particular student is very smart and he is capable of reading. There are a lot of fundamental skills that are missing, but look, this is a general ed curriculum and he's making progress. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, you're a bridge builder, Allie. That's right. It's very <laughs> yeah. hard, depending on the day. <laughs> well, I was, I was just going to say, having, um, you know, learned from you for many years, I think uh, your use of meta level measures in general, but like the chart family, I think has always just hit me because I think not that the consumers or other um, people who might have a vested interest in what's changing don't connect to the daily per minute or the day chart, but I do think sometimes those larger time scales are where some of that social validity or usability or like values that live and you've always been awesome about ensuring no matter what chart it was whether it's the daily chart that's serving that but if you need a weekly chart or a monthly chart to do it um you always have a chart living where it matters in terms of how to inform so Aww, thank you great. for you yeah, and um, so much like Carrie, when I uh, originally saw Allison um, show data to track curricular progress, uh, we also have adopted that. And um, we'll do an analysis of the, you know, kids at FIT enroll in 50 hour blocks. And so we start over at each uh, 50 hour enrollment if they're gonna have more than one in terms of tracking uh, progress through the curriculum, but we'll also analyze those data with respect to their overall frequency of personal bests and aims, as well as their whatever progress monitoring skills that we uh, charts that we have in, right? So it's helped us identify 
kids who, you know, might struggle, they can get personal best after warmups multiple times, but coming in hot on the first timing that to pass a program is perhaps a little more challenging. And so we'll look at the relationship between that curricular progress, session progress, and then global progress on things like standardized progress monitoring tools. So um, anyway, just uh, uh, another nod to you because this was not something that we used to do and we've found tremendous value in just broadening again that real contextual analysis of uh, the, the session, you know, more globally and the kids progress towards our academic goals. Oh, that makes my heart happy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one little point related to what Kent was saying about how, you know, educators think it's just time in or whatever. Uh, this is called butts and seats in the corporate training world. And it's shocking that very large companies, for example, one of my current clients, Facebook, there's some really smart people there. But when you bring up the idea of actually, well, how, what are the criteria for mastery of this stuff? It's like, uh, I don't know, they got through the session, you know, it's, ah. so it's ubiquitous, unfortunately. Right. Ali, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Stop sharing now, Ray. Hold on yeah. a second. <laughs> and then uh, Rick. There we go. You're up next, buddy. Okay. So starting off my chart share, uh, why do I love the chart? I have to start at the very beginning of my history, which as a green, uh, right out of high school, really um, you know, complete new, I had the honor and privilege of working with Steve Graff. And that picture to the right, by the way, when uh, Steve Graff went through phases, he had a, his first phase was the Lone Ranger. His next phase was the coach, and his last phase was like a Star Trek phase, and I had him during the coach phase, and uh, it was, uh, you know, just one of, uh, one of his great quirks. That picture to the right was taken in the late 70s, but seven of those, those are faculty from YSU, uh, I had seven of those professors, and certainly Steve impacted me the most. And back in my first class with him was within 1986. And he's like, hey, here's this chart. And how does it affect me? You know, I was a young college student. And so at the time I was golfing and I used precision teaching to help me become a better golfer. And ever since from 1986 to this day, I'm always running personal charts. Sometimes I have more than others, but there are certain personal charts that are critically important for me that I have to monitor. And one is what I'm going to share today, and that is my writing behavior. Uh, so the pinpoint is free writes, a uh, word for publication. And what I do is I sit down, and whenever I write, I always time myself for how long I write. And my rules are, if I have a new word that's produced, that's a count of one. And if I'm editing, then I'll have track changes in, and I'll only count if I have produced a new word. So if I delete words or a paragraph, that doesn't count. And what you see here, uh, you know, I look at this each semester, and uh, this uh, over the spring, you can see where uh, you know this started and uh, I have days that I write and then I have days that, well actually that's uh, spring semester end. So this, uh, before the fall semester began, that's the summer. And to the left of that would be the spring semester. You can see that there are some days that uh, go by where I don't have a lot of writing and you know, if you go back to the left and you'll notice there's a lot of uh, real estate there and open real estate. And that's because there, there was a time in my life where I was traveling uh, to New Jersey almost every other week. I was in my car 
20 hours a week and it really impacted my productivity. And one of the big lessons that I've learned uh, through the years is you know, a lot of times when you meet people in precision teaching, they become what I'll call celebration centric. They only look at celebration. It's like, oh, is this going up or is it going down? But uh, if you do professional behaviors or whatever, a lot of times you're interested in the level. Of course, you know, we already talked about bounce and how important that is, but looking at the average. So in this chart, you can see over the summer, you know, there's not a huge celebration. What I've learned is from semester to semester, if I start off low, I'm going to have a celebration. But if I start off high, I'll have a deceleration. And eventually it starts to level out and my acceleration gets closer and closer to one when I get more consistent. But the orange level, that level line you'll see is uh, the average of how many words I write and that's for that entire condition. So my goal by the aim band is uh, 200 to 400 words. And you can see that uh, at least over the summer, I really kicked butt and uh, did well. This is what it looks like. Uh, it, when you go to a weekly view, and again, you can see from semester to semester how, uh, depending on what's going on in my life, I have uh, different levels. And again, the acceleration uh, is a factor of where I started off in the semester. And because I chart this and I, have to, I write professionally, I'm always writing things, uh, this, if you do it, it leads to particular outcomes. And, you know, this, what it's led for me is to this point in my career, I've written 75 peer reviewed articles. I have to because of my job. I've written seven chapters and I'm up to three books. That last book was my summer project. I'm going to be releasing that pretty soon in uh, this fall, but there's a direct relationship between how much I'm writing in the outcomes and the things that I'm producing. Mm -hmm. So that's it for me. I will open this up to questions and comments. Well, three cheers for the second book. I, I use it a lot and we recommend it a lot. And I'm looking forward to the third one. <laughs> and so that's a good <laughs> thing. You. That reminds me of um, when, one of my teachers in grad, uh, when I was in grad school, Ellen Reese used to chart her words per day. Uh, and but he didn't. She didn't have a standard acceleration chart, but um, she just kind of flashed me back to that. So it's it seems like uh, have you have you had any opportunity to or what opportunities have you had to make interventions based on these uh, data? Is this just a kind of the state of Rick's life, or is there something that happened on a chart that made you do more or less of something in order to to change it, or what's going on? Uh, there's a lot of, I left the annotation lines off, but I will, it gets really messy when I start tracking all the things that impact my writing. So if I'm for vacation, if I'm traveling, if I'm sick, all of those things are in there. And if I notice that there is a, uh, a dip in my uh, level, or if it does, when, you know, the acceleration does happen to go, you know, I'm tracking these big chunks, uh, I will intervene and it's nothing really simple. It's more of a, a kick in the butt. And one thing I have noticed is the longer I stay away from writing, the harder it is to get back. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's the people talk about behavior and momentum. We've been talking about rhythm. There's that, that is so real. Mm -hmm. And I have felt that through the years and it, it really is a big problem. Even if I write five minutes, you know, if I can just get something done in the day, that helps propel my writing behavior forward. So mm -hmm. I, I certainly don't have any elaborate interventions other than uh, guilting myself and being like, I really got to start uh, working. So if other of you have those kinds of interventions, I'd well, love to hear uh, So a little point on that. I'll, I'm sorry to hog, if I'm hogging, tell me to shut up. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it were just, this work reminds me of Billy Baum's work. So we're talking about response allocation. So how many, different allocated spots in your life are there? There's the writing allocation of behavior, but then there's other allocations he talks about. And so when you, when you engage more in one behavior and one allocation, then does it reduce 
your behavior in another allocation and is that a problem? You know, for example, I'm writing a storm now, but I find my reading uh, has squeezed out. And so you have to like look at that. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, can something else squeeze out as this goes up? So looking at it like allocation could be helpful to you. You know, are there things- That that is a wonderful comment. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's really, you know, I was just as Rick as you were sharing this. I I actually I started two charts for myself because one of the impacts of COVID on my life uh, has been a decrease in uh, consumption of scientific uh, journals. Uh, I just am not reading as much uh, as I was pre-COVID. And so I just started a chart for myself on uh, free to read pages in scientific journals daily. And to the point of, uh, you know, we are writing a paper right now and I literally sit down and I'm like, I cannot, I did a passive active voice tutorial with Drew last weekend. We spent, and I'm like, I need a chart on this because it's not the simple sentence, it's the complex ones. Those are the trickier ones, right? So I'm just for myself thinking of like, okay, what charts can I be keeping? And so you've inspired me. That's really my main point here. Uh, Rick, do you write more than one thing at a time? Like more than one publication or? Good question. As you're writing your book, you're also writing articles? Uh, occasionally it's really hard for me to do that. Like over the summer, I mean, COVID has ramped up my writing to unprecedented levels. I also have a monthly chart where I look at my monthly totals and I have just never been writing this much, uh, in my life. And, uh, I find that really hard to do. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Because what aren't you doing? So you always want to ask the, you know, to the, the flip you know yeah oh, i'm writing a lot so what aren't you doing a lot i mean it's, there's just so much time you know yeah. <laughs> that gets chewed I, up. I have other questions i have like drill down questions about okay. your like habits like do you write at a particular time of day do you open with some type of free write i remember um i had put up a chart at charter when you're as a help chart and i remember carl and abigail both had a lot of suggestions think about things that skinner did of like the dailiness of like the routine and the rhythm of it but the protected space, like writing at the same time of day. And for a while, I actually found that like handwriting, um, like a note to my grandma just to get prose going. So like to Kendra's point, I find that if I'm trying to say it complex, it's a total fluency barrier. And so actually just saying it is English and having it be part of an editing process later. So I'm just here. I'm always like wanting to collect more things because I realize weeds kind of creep into my writing repertoire that tend to slow me down and I think Carl this might have actually been your suggestion um making sure I stopped on a flow so I'm curious I see your data don't have record floor so I'm curious like what's your rule about how long you write and when you decide to stop for a day that that's a really good question what I've learned across time part of me uh, you know, I, I grew up as an ADHD kid, and I've been, those elements have been with me my entire life, and there's a lot of disorganization that goes in me, but one thing that I have learned is if you work as hard as anything, you know, a sledgehammer approach, you can get through just about anything. You just got to work super hard. So all everything that you said about those people, I've never integrated it. I'd probably be more productive. I just, you know, uh, if I write, I use this app called Pomodoro. And every 25 minutes, you stop and take a break. So if I write for four hours, that that will take me eight hours of my day. Because writing isn't just, like, there's a lot of other things that go to it. But if you put in that time, you're going to be incredibly productive. And frankly, I could be, you know, like, if you compare me against other people, there are other people that are, you know, way at these very high levels. And, you know, I'm I'm at a good level. But you know, I have colleagues that uh, publish eight articles a year. I'm, I'm productive. I publish four. But if I were more productive, I could probably do six to eight along with other things. So it's, it's really good. And my only answer is I just try to work as hard as I can. And that allows me to be productive. 
terrific conversation. <laughs> I know we can all benefit from those types of professional behaviors, Rick. Thank you for sharing that. Carrie, you're up. All right. Um, so my chart uh, is like nothing new to you guys. It's, you know, I'm not coming in with a unique behavior like a lot of you have brought today. But the purpose of me bringing it um, is more for the recorded audience to um, share something that I feel is often overlooked and not frequently included in practice. Um, I think we do a better job in precision teaching than in the world of education or behavior analysis as a whole. But, um, and I'm glad that we kind of already started the conversation off on it, but is looking at those composite behaviors, right? So we do a really awesome job at improving the skill that we're working on. I think that behavior analysis, precision teaching, like, you know, if we're measuring it and we have really awesome interventions, like we're probably gonna get the outcome that we're looking for. Um, so this learner um, that I'm sharing, this was, years ago, because I was like, oh, what charts? Because uh, I've been out of the clinical practice for a bit uh, now. And so I went through my, you know, uh, history of charts. And I, uh, I encountered this one because, uh, to Kelly's credit uh, using this term, it has some chart gymnastics, which I always loved. And um, and it shows this good uh, composite analysis that's pretty straightforward that people can pick up and start using uh, often and, and they understand how to do the component composite or element compound analysis, then they can integrate this with whatever skills that they're targeting. So this, uh, just a history on this learner, she was uh, private school, first grade, no diagnosis, but didn't know how to read phonetically. She was a in the china shop when she was trying to read and cite words and maybe guess based on the first two letters but they were going to hold her back and re uh re uh, take first grade just because of her reading and in this private school and i had been working uh with this private school and i was like just let's do it let's just i, I think she has potential she's a super bright kid let's just do intensive sessions over the summer and you see where she's at when we're done. Just let's, let's just try that. And they agreed. Um, and so here are, now these are application checks. So these are the composite skills. Um, I gotta move your all spaces now because you're on my chart. Okay. So we would work on, um, like letters uh, in consonants uh, aside or vowel side, right? Not uh, together uh, um, as a singular timing. Um, so the breadth of how close uh, they were to the actual training is like, this was super close, right? Um, and as the chart is split up between, it's a weekly chart. So as it's split up between four months, they have each column, it gets further and further away from what we were actually training on. And we were training on her working on nonsense words because she, uh, her ability to guess the real word was really good. Uh, so we had to sever that history of her actually knowing any uh, actual word that could be on the sheet. And when you're dealing with short vowel words or long vowel words, you know, there's a good likelihood that she's going to encounter some of that. So we, you know, she was reading uh, some crazy words that follow that phonetic rule. Um, and so these were just uh, application checks every week on uh, different versions. So there were three different versions that we would rotate. So that wasn't the same sheet and we always pick a different starting spot every week. But here is sounding out short vowel real words. Here's reading short vowel real words, sounding out uh, long vowel real words, and then reading long vowel real words. And then there's uh, another chart uh, that I didn't 
uh, have on here, but that then carries it out throughout some more higher level phonetic word patterns. Um, and so that's what we did. So we would train wherever she was at, but on um, nonsense words whenever she would get there. Um, you know, used uh, programs, uh, used a lot of Elizabeth's programs. And, um, and I actually was thinking about doing the what's missing. I also have a good chart of, of her on, on that one. But, uh, but I wanted to show these data because I like to make decisions based on these data. Um, Cause again, it's like, yeah, you should, you should be seeing acceleration or increases in accuracy or stuff like that on your intervention. Um, and, and sometimes we get too stuck at looking at the bark of the tree that's in the forest. And so, you know, this is us stepping away and looking at, okay, is this actually impacting at a more global level, not a super global level, but you know, is this impacting uh, generative reading uh, for this for this girl? Is she actually learning the uh, phonetic rules? Is this applicable um, and all that kind of stuff? So, uh, just really short and simple, integrating some composite checks into your into your programming uh, and you can do this easily by conducting a element compound analysis uh, right from the start and making sure that you know your intervention data is hooked up to something uh, that you're you're looking at uh, a little bit more globally mm -hmm. um, that's it full chart Carrie, thank you for that. I mean, this is, it's far from simple, actually. I mean, having these kind of anchors is really important and it's often overlooked. And so I really appreciate you sharing this chart. Yeah, I, I love the split charting. That was all I was gonna say. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, and, I, and, and for me, like your, yours was really cool because you wanted to look at both of them at the same time. And while some of these I did, but it's also was like, I got the kid for a, for the summer, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted it on a weekly chart, and that's prime real estate, you know. A yeah. weekly chart is prime real estate, and you know, like it wasn't going to take up the whole thing. And so, um, and and also just for staff management, we would always put the weekly charts, our app checks, at the front of the book, and you see that I have it like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like. So we created a schedule of when they would run. They would run them at the beginning of the session. Uh, so they were like really functioning as probes uh, without any practice effects with regards to the actual programming. And so it would just be like, here's these, you know, these split charts at the beginning. Let's do some app checks. Cool. Great. Now let's start with your actual programming for the rest of the book. Um, and that way they didn't get lost in the, uh, in the shuffle of the training programs. I love it too, because it's a, it's a true measure of social validity of your programming as well. And behavior analysis, all too often we equate social acceptability to social validity. And just because an intervention is acceptable doesn't mean it's benefiting or having interactions with real world situations. And having these app checks is this very good measure of social validity of what I'm doing with the learner, is that having an impact on their life? Is it making right. them a better spot? And that's, that to me is when you were showing these, it's like, that's exactly what that's looking at. Like, is this having a, a real world benefit for the learner or are we just growing dots to say that we could? Well, and that's, and that's exactly yeah. my thing is that like, so often we can say that about, we, we, like I said, we're staring at the bark and we're like, yay, they have 300 tacks. And you're like, okay, great. Why is that important? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what is the overarching goal? Where are we going with that? You know, like, so I think, you know, always keeping that, you know, and, and it's, and it's maybe not that like macro level, right? Cause that's like really down at the end of the line that, that you don't get to measure as often, but this lets you know a little bit of prediction of, of how that's going to look. Right. So um, I like, I feel like this level, this, you know, 
the composite check, the application check, like it's just needs to happen a little bit more often. Especially for uh, late middle, late elementary and middle school teachers who you're asking to do things that are out of their, you know, zone. And so you can show that it's not, you're not wasting their time. Uh, right. And that it is impacting on, oh, they can read that chapter faster. So it's, uh, it's, it's important work to do in, in general ed, really important. I also really like um, just a reiteration of the, you know, we kind of talk about it paneling a chart as you've done. And, uh, you know, much like Drew, we have a convention that a lot of my coaches use that I haven't shared here today because I don't know if I'm gonna get a, a finger wag for doing it, but we'll manipulate the bottom uh, scale and the, and the bottom cycle of the chart. Um, so that we can see two behaviors moving in time together. Um, and uh, just an example of, I think I saw that uh, Drew did something like that on his juggling chart. And I think it's just another beautiful example of uh, making the chart work for you. Yeah. And I, you know, really, um, and I think that that's a great way to just have people feel really welcomed in our community is, you know, um, I'm pretty established in this community, but I still had a little bit of fear of uh, some finger wagging. <laughs> well, I, I think we should all work on speaking up on that stuff more. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I split the chart that way for Allie's, Allie's chart that she's short. So I have a cumulative, I forget which one it is. I have a cumulative, I think on the bottom, but on the top, I'll do the weekly, the raw weekly, the yeah. data. Um, so, uh, I do it that way. And then, yeah, I, uh, I remember I, Rick had me on, uh, for a webinar and I was talking about shaping the precision learner and taking from like discrete trials to free operant. And I remember being nervous about talking yeah. about that. And I, I too was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be kicked out of the club, but I know. <laughs> I know. One of my coaches just started doing it and it, and, and it was selected because there was, a, you know, an a analytical goal had been met with that. And it's, you know, you don't want to stifle that. And so right. I agree with you, yeah. Jason. That is something that, uh, that I think that we need to speak up. I think we need to say it more. You know, yeah. Kathy Fox and I were on a project where we taught some new people how to chart. And we warned them. We said, look, what's important is that you're making decisions. You're using this to teach kids. Don't yes. get caught up. Don't let some old timer PT person come <laughs> in and, and be nitpicky with you on something. Well, it suppresses and, innovation, and, right? You're right. So... And sure enough, not long after we were there, an old time PT -er showed up and got on them over the way they were drawing their phase change lines. He said they should be shorter than the length. He didn't like that they were a certain length on the chart. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, these people are making decisions now and you're showing up and like raining on their parade over the length of a line. Yeah. This is not what we should be yeah. focusing on or worried about. Yeah. Uh, people making decisions and helping kids learn. Right. So yeah, the more so, we can see it, the better. Yes, to, to Guy Bruce's point, you know, are you being pragmatic or dogmatic? Right. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. <laughs> that's, yes. That's great. And I've got that uh. dance going in, that, in the Summer Institute now, two years now. It's like pragmatic, dogmatic. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> Man, the just gym quotes coming out of this. Uh, <laughs> you got a couple of t-shirts to make here. <laughs> oh my God. I have learned Fragmented. so much already. This is, gosh, I mean, and we're, we still have Kent and Kyle left. <laughs> Kent, you're up, pal. I'm up, so I'm going to share my screen. All right. So I have a I have a personal chart. Uh, uh, I started. Uh, this is a walking chart. So I remember starting working on my walking behavior. Uh, um, um, I don't know, maybe close to a decade ago. I remember sharing my first walking charts with uh, Elizabeth and Hank at a bar somewhere. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since then, um, I've changed my pinpoints uh, according to the data. So I'm a big, I'm an avid follower of the walking health data charts. Uh, 
most people talk about 10,000 steps a day. You know, I don't, no one really knows where that came from. There's no data behind that. Okay. Uh, uh, I remember Sigrid Glenn saying to me, well, if you do 10,000, then you're bound to meet some of these other uh, research points. And maybe that's true. But two research points about walking are represented by the pencil line, the regular pencil line and the red line that I have on the chart. I want to talk about the red line first because it's the one that I've been working on the longest. And this is based on uh, data that is remaining pretty consistent over time that if you walk, of course, it's not in our metric, so I had to do some gyrations that I'll explain in a minute. If you walk 30 minutes of moderate steps five days a week, then there's all these health benefits that arise. So first of all, what's a moderate step? Well, moderate stepping is walking between three and six miles an hour. And so a lot of people stroll, you know, I had these other kind of set of adjectives for walking now. You know, when you focus on something, you get all these distinctions, right? So, so walking is about moderate steps uh, and uh, three to six miles an hour. Now, most people's phones don't give you that kind of information. They just give you total steps. So it's hard. So I have, uh, I'm remaining with my Omni, which is my little, uh, my, my, my timer that I carry. It has a has a clock in it and it also tracks moderate steps and total steps and it tracks miles too. And I bought this at REI, it's, uh, it's called by Omni, it's uh, Omni 40, I believe this one is. And uh, it has a battery in it, so I gotta replace the battery. So you kind of like well, old school here. But it gives me my moderate steps, which is what I am trying to find. And this one can be in any position in your pocket and it's not gonna stop recording and I can, uh, you have to measure your, your, your stride and then you uh, engage in your stride uh, so many times in so much time. And I was able to figure out that for, for me to walk moderate stepping, for me, moderate stepping is about four and a half. I tend to walk about four and a half miles an hour when I move into moderate step walking. Uh, Although that's decreased slightly over the last few years. I think it's getting closer to four. It's interesting to see how I am so imperceptibly slowing down as I, <laughs> as I get older. It's just interesting sidebar there. Uh, so the red bar list shows you that uh, 30 minutes of moderate steps is about 3,500 3, steps for me, 36 or so, 100 steps per uh, uh, you know, when I when 30 minutes is up, I've walked about 3,600 steps. And so I have my line on the on my comp per day chart. And then uh, and then I'll chart my total moderate steps. And I'll, my goal is to stay on or above the red line. Uh, so you can see that uh, up at the top, I have numbers. So the second number tells you how many days in the week that I walked uh, 30 minutes of moderate steps. Mm -hmm. And so you see across the top, six, five, six, six, four, five, four, seven, six, seven. So every time I hit the, the, the uh, health data goal, which is five, uh, then I give myself a red star. Uh, so you can see, uh, and there's that, that um, talk about Billy Baum and response allocation and talk about uh, the Summer Institute that Drew referred to. When we're working on the Summer Institute, I lost two, uh, two red stars because uh, I was working so much with the students who are in the Summer Institute. But otherwise I'm doing, I'm, I really kind of got that one down. And you can see, I want to uh, focus also on another point. Look how tightly the stimulus control is in the last three, three and a half weeks, mm -hmm. right? So what does that say? Well, oh, that's really good stimulus control, but it also says that I'm kind of, obligated to go out and take more steps right, <laughs> in order to meet my goal. So I'm getting very goal oriented, which is concerning me. So I'm, I'm looking for any other fellow walkers, you know, what, what is it that you do, you can do to not find yourself having to do some steps in order to meet your minimum standards. So that's a, that's a question for conversation. Let me talk about the top, but otherwise I'm not, I'm not dropping down anymore. When the Summers Institute ended, I, 
I'm not dropping below five uh, uh, at all. Uh, and so once in the last three and a half weeks. So I'm very happy about that. The pencil line is a relatively new uh, data point showing consistent data. And that's that people over 60, uh, those of you, some of you are getting there. <laughs> but people over 60, and this is a very reliable phenomena, who walk an average of 7,500 steps per day in a week's time have are living about three years longer than those who aren't. And it's just a, like remarkable how the drop in, in, uh, in heart disease and strokes and even cancers as a function of maintaining 7,500 steps per day on average per week. And so that line, uh, that pencil, regular pencil line above uh, that's on the chart is at the 7,500 uh, steps per day point. Um, I, you can see that in starting this, in this summer, I really struggled with keeping that. I, I was able to do the moderate steps. I, you know, maybe it's because I've do, been doing them longer, but, uh, you know, I've been doing the moderate step thing for a couple of years now, but it's mo been more in the last six months that I've been on this new data point. And it's, yeah, I did struggle some with, uh, even my pencil star didn't give it to me. So it, so the star, uh, uh, in the regular pencil there, underneath the, the a pair of numbers up at the top, uh, indicates that I met the average of 7,500 square, 7,500 steps per day for that week. And so now I, after the Summer Institute ended, now I've been more consistently getting that uh, regular pencil star the last three weeks, and I'll get it this week too, except this damn... Uh, uh, orange sky out there makes me reticent to walk outside for, for uh, even a half an hour. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, <laughs> I know it's really bad right today. Wait so, five days. Wait for the rain. Yeah, <laughs> right. I might have to kill a couple of days here uh, and just not do it. Um, but anyway, um, I am also hugging the line carefully as well. That stimulus control of 7,500 per day, per week, is uh, also showing you uh, my, my, my contextual feeling here is, geez, I gotta go outside now for another 20, 1,200 steps, and I, I will do that in order to meet my goal, but I'd rather not turn my walking into a task, and I, and I you know, I really, I really enjoy, you know, you know, you all know me. I'm a very movement-oriented person. Talk about ADHD. So it's very, um, uh, it's not that I don't, that, that I'm sedentary in that regard. I'm not sitting still very much, but I'm just finding it a little more tasky to go and meet my two health goals. So uh, I'm doing it, but I'm, um, that there, I had one blip up that was uh, that in the 7,500, I got uh, 12,000 steps when I went over and visited Carl over on Bainbridge Island and we walked on the beach. That was a really good time. And so my, my little blip up there last Sunday was from my, uh, Cody and I went to visit Carl and Jeremy and we walked a lot. So, uh, but otherwise um, I'm not quite getting there. Um, I, I'd like to see more uh, uh, regular pencil dots well above that line and you know maybe a few more of the red pencil marks uh, maybe some doubles maybe getting some higher frequencies rather than just hogging the minimum line so that's my that's my chart so I'll go after Carl go ahead Carl so I so I have a sort of suggestion question which is I I live on this beautiful island and I just can walk up the dirt road to go to woods that I can walk through for three or four miles in a beautiful park. And for me, checking out how the park changes every day during the season is a big deal. And the woods, hearing the birds and all the rest of it. And maybe urban environment doesn't make it as easy, but do you have places you like to go and you sort of say, hey, I want to see what's going on in Volunteer Park this morning. To me, that's a big part of, it's still, you're still juggling the thing of well, I'd probably better walk today because I haven't for three days because I've been busy. But still, it's like, you know, it's a positive consequence. 
Well, that's a really uh, good, so, you know, find more spaces. I am getting kind of bored with my, okay, yeah. now I'm going to walk up to Madison or now I'm going to, so I, I think moving to new spaces, that's a good idea. Maybe that'll get well, me more. That's uh, what I was going to say. I think your uh, own thing on like response allocation, you know, our lives have gotten narrow. And so the mm -hmm. thing that's easy to notice is the steps rather than yeah. the things that happen when you're taking steps. So I think yeah. to Carl's point, like going to a different neighborhood and you produced it with your own data point of being on Bainbridge. <laughs> you talked in conversation, you talked with new scenery. Yeah. So, you know, go walk in Ballard, come come to Beacon Hill, Ken. Um, yeah, maybe just if get you, If you car. spark yourself of what you see along the way, not that you have to count bird sounds, you know, I don't, I don't think that, but if your attention shifts to like the new noticing, the steps are going to get you to those things and you'll end up grabbing them. So get in the <laughs> car and drive to another spot and then walk and then do the walk. Okay. Maybe. The you other know, cool. Another, um, oh, go yeah. ahead, Carl. I was just going to add one more thing, which is the cool thing about doing it in nature. And I was thinking a volunteer park is close to your house. Every day is different. There's different stuff there. And I happen to like be a nature freak. So I really like, Oh, the, the, you know, the colors are turning now or, Hey, the ducks are out or whatever. So to me, even if you go to the same place, a lot of times if there's enough change in that place, it's worth, you know, it's a draw. So that's, that's one point. thing, you know? Good yeah. Point. So I just kind of piggyback on Carl and Kelly. Um, I'm, uh, I also very much enjoy movement and walking, et cetera. And when I'm, when I'm at my cabin location, I can really get behind, you know, where, what Carl is pointing to. So it's just things shift in that environment so much that just being there is new and different a little bit every time. However, when I'm at my house in Reno, uh, it's urban. And so that uh, it's not afforded in the same way as being in Tahoe National Forest. And so I will try to find something that's kind of special. So it's not necessarily just walking for walking's sake, but I will have an album that I really want to listen to or somebody that I, I'm going to use that opportunity to really connect with somebody over the phone and not be in the car driving. And, you know, so I'll try to find some other kind of a value that I can tap into on that walk. If it's, you know, if it's not going to be the, you know, the changes in the environment, the nature um, that will really appeal to me, I'll try to find another like, wow, I haven't listened to that, you know, Credence Clearwater Revival album in a really long time from start to finish, like no Pandora, just the, like the album and the order in which the uh, artist intended. Right. And just I can be really present with that on a walk. And so that's something that I do to mix it up in my urban environment, Ken. Well, that's good. Thank you, uh, Kendra. Thanks, Carl, too. Those are those are really good. Things yeah, that... Those are all good suggestions. I thought I'd get something out of this. So <laughs> you need to get yourself a dog. Yeah. <laughs> get yourself a dog, Ken. Here you go. You and Cody, they'll be great. <laughs> I've started listening to audiobooks for my walks and I give myself like a one or two or three chapter goal and so if my mind is engaged on something else I don't even notice that I'm walking as much and yeah. that's helped me mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a really good idea because I have a lot yeah. of friends who listen to podcasts and I only have a 12 minute commute or else a two minute one to my office studio so I don't I asked somebody, like, when the heck do you do this? They said, oh, yeah. we're driving. I said, well, sorry, I don't drive much. But that's perfect. Get into some podcasts. Mm -hmm. I, I used to have a, a four-hour-a-day commute, and that's I, I, was, I was just churning out books left and right. And then when that commute stopped with COVID, I missed – I mean, I was also paying for my Audible account every month, and it was a waste of money because I wasn't doing anything with it. And so then I just replaced it with the walking. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. I think too, it, like for me, I know that there's different establishing operations that control walks, even though topographically they look the same. Yeah. Like when I'm walking for the natural reinforcer of what Kendra was saying, like beautiful scenery coming into access with those things, discovering it's a very different set of motivated variables than if I'm walking because I have to, because I don't want to be sedentary. Right. And that's when I start seeing, I sprinkle in some arbitrary reinforcers where it's like, 
hey, do you want to go for a walk? Let's grab a couple beers and put it in the backpack and go. Because in Savannah, it's legal. <laughs> I don't want you all to think I'm like, in Savannah, we have an open carry container uh, policy. So we'll just grab two cocktails and, and walk and kind of supplement. Because it's like, there's not too much to see in Savannah. It's a tiny place. After you've it's seen true it. in Capitol Hill, too. I mean, yeah. really. <laughs> so it's like, that, but that's a different, to me, that's functionally a different reason why I'm walking. Because the reinforcer is functionally different. Yeah, so. that's a good point, Drew to kind of look at it. Yeah. All right. Well, these are great suggestions. I have, uh, here's my, this is my uh, number of days of meeting moderate steps with five being the health data. And I'm all, I always, I, and this chart's almost irrelevant now. So I, I should probably, maybe I should, maybe I should throw this one, stop this one. Although I kind of like always meeting my goal so uh, but maybe i should do a uh, one on the 7500 average uh per day per week maybe that would motivate me what i love about these charts can't and every time when i when i come to seattle and you show me these i think we've had these conversations where it's to rick's point it's not looking at acceleration you know, this is your maintenance, oh, maintenance chart. chart it's a maintenance yeah. chart exactly yeah. It's not like, how do I keep growing? It's, I need to be here. And that's what I think glad that you shared this one because it shows people that they're going to be watching this, that it's not just, okay, let me just keep it at times two. And it's like, what? No, I'm there. I just got to stay yeah, there. Exactly. It's really, it's, uh, it's really, you know, precision teaching for me is all about growth, you know, but this one, these are maintenance charts. These are kind of not in that PT zone. So I kind of, uh, yeah, so to your point, yes. I, agree. I also like how, as a quintessential teacher, you're giving yourself stars for good performance. <laughs> you write it on your paper. I do too. Oh my God. I do too. You know, I, that's a, it's funny. You know, when I started Morningside, and I was, you know, I got my my degree in educational psychology, right? And so I'm like, am I going to teach now? Am I going to be like a school teacher? And so it was just kind of not in a really. Uh, uh, Settled, settling, but, but then I did it for 11 years and I'm like, I get why people like this. There's so much many natural, so much natural reinforcement related to watching a child change to me. I, it was just one of the most powerful things that a lot of people don't experience that people like me. I mean, I have so many colleagues at ABBA who have never stepped foot in, in a classroom teaching children. You know? So that's really important. So the stars still live. <laughs> colors and you know all this sort of thing that's really cool i also Dude. wanted to share some unless people have other things to say I, we have a new book coming out i said i was writing a storm up so the so uh myself and libby street and andrew Keita and joanne and i the four of us have created this uh a near monstrous volume of 500 pages uh on the morningside model generative instruction now and that's going to be coming out through the Century Psychology Series at Sloan uh, this fall. And so we're really excited about that. We've taken that little purple book and just kind of multiplied it by three. And so uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm really pleased with what we've done in there. It's got a philosophy chapter, it has a design chapter, it has reading, writing, math, uh, uh, instruction, practice, application, generative responding, uh, a data chapter, what we do when we go into school. So, so I'm really, I'm really pleased with that coming out. So my writing has been growing. Uh, COVID has been very helpful, actually. And kind of all the deadlines fell away when I was working with Sloan. <laughs> you know, we had a deadline of March and we're still writing now because once the virus hit, all that sort of thing just flew out the window. We have a much better book than we would have had if we didn't have the virus. So I'm always looking for some silver linings. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this goddamn thing. So, uh, and this is one, you know, and I'm really on a roll now with writing. I think that whole uh, behavioral momentum, now I just have to figure about the allocation part about when am I, how am I gonna get my reading back to where it was uh, and also write. They seem to, those two uh, spaces seem to be so there's something about those two spaces where one takes from the other and not from something that's less similar. So I, I'm, uh, I don't know, I do some more inquiry about that. But these are some, uh, we, this is our the table on the pinpoints. We have our, uh, our pinpoints for um, reading prerequisites, 
and then we have our pinpoints for word fluency, and then we have our pinpoints for comprehension beginning with uh, passage fluency. And so that's how we're talking about reading these days. And so if, you're, uh, if you want me to send these out, I can do that. Uh, but the book and the book will be out uh, in the uh, in the uh, later this in the fall, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah, please send them out. Hey. That's terrific. Yeah, that's awesome, Ken. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ken. All um, right, I'll stop sharing now. And thanks for all the feedback, everyone. And now, Carl. Carl, you're all righty. Okay, so I'm probably going to share the oldest the oldest charts of anyone. Let's see, I just want to find my, I got a bunch of stuff to move around on. So maybe I'll just do my desktop here and then I'll go to that. So this is, so I'm, I'm two things. One is, um, can you guys see that article, that B Barrett thing there that I've got commuterization thing? Is that visible? Yes. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm sharing this particular thing because Elizabeth asked me to. Um, I love the chart pr basically because I love behavior frequency and acceleration in, uh, because it's the most sensitive measure we've got. And there's a lot more to say about it, but also because it's always been a source of discovery and insight for me. And I go back to this article by B. Barrett, which you can get on fluency.org, because it's where we first published a set of data that I've probably shown to 10 or 20,000 people, and I suspect Kent has comparably but where it comes from is the fact that B. Barrett, when she got into this world with Og Lindsley and Fred Skinner, was interested in the sensitivity of frequency as a measure. Uh, a lot of behavior, behaviorists, when they, in the early work, were uh, focused on kind of generalities and general principles. But B, having been an educational and clinical assessment person, was interested in sensitivity. So her research was always, always about that. And when she first asked me to take her program instruction discrete trials classroom and turn it and start seeing what we could discover using the standard acceleration chart in 1974. Um, uh, one of the things we started doing is just measuring lots of component. We, and Eric Houghton then was very influential within those couple of years. We started looking at component behavior and this publication, which was 1979 was actually the data set in here. We, we captured a, a few, a, a, a couple of years earlier. And so I think probably every, oops, this is not what I was gonna share you, sh show you. I think probably everybody here, let me open up PowerPoint. Uh, can you see this? The, the uh, count per minute reveals important differences thing now? Uh, Carl, can you just slide that control all the way up to the top of the screen? Cause covering up here, is yeah. it in the way? Yeah, it was in Sorry. the way. So this is a data set that probably everybody here has seen, although possibly the people who might be watching this later haven't, but this was, pretty important. And it was important because when we first started um, looking at frequencies in the classroom uh, in 73, 74, um, we, a uh, couple of our colleagues there, Fran George and Debbie Pease were doing some research in their graduate work and so forth. And so we, we measured frequencies on these component skills. We were working, it was a, it was a revolutionary classroom because Barrett was taking institutional residents who were had various diagnoses, but certainly nobody had ever tried to teach them pre-vocational or pre-academic pre type skills. So you can look at these pinpoints, putting pegs in the pegboard, copying printed strokes, uh, copying numerals zero to nine, writing numbers of various complexities, basically one zeros, five, uh, a dashes, sevens, fours, and nines, which of course have different degrees of, you know, components themselves, saying the names of pictures, basically see, say pictures, uh, see, say numbers, rote counting, I think it was zero, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, repeatedly, putting tiles into a can, which was a font component, motor component, counting tiles into a can, which was these two things in one-to-one in -one correspondence, counting fixed tiles and counting up tiles per set. And of course, the frequency ranges. These, what we did is 30 second timings with these three groups. Our state school students, uh, who were institutionalized and so forth, who were the, the hatched bars, uh, little regular kids between five and seven years old, and some professional adults, most of whom had graduate degrees. And so these ranges of correct responding are not shocking. I mean, in virtually every one, um, you know, the adult frequencies in the black bars were higher than the regular little kids were higher than the 
students that we were working with that had various disabilities. And as we've talked about over the years, and Kent's also highlighted, you can see relationships between some of these component skills, relatively component and composite things. And it was very illuminating. And to me, it demonstrated a whole bunch of things, but one of them was that uh, how sensitive this measure was. And of course, as people probably know, the punchline in this, and I showed these data for decades because I was trying to make people aware of what, what we had here, was that we could see this this way, but if we looked at the way that educators um, from generally preschool to graduate school are measuring uh, learning, uh, since all of those frequencies were, uh, were, were correct per minute, if we measured accuracy, percent correct, which is what everybody in the world apparently does but us, you couldn't see the difference. So you couldn't see the difference between a severely disabled person, a little kid and a person with a PhD and this is what our educational system in America is based on. So I always like to make that point, and I think it's why it's worth sharing. But I wanted to add a couple things uh, based on what other people were talking about. And I think the word that I heard Kendra use was paneling, which I've never, I've never heard that word. But something that Eric taught us, uh, taught me at least, was to take a chart and create slices. And in this case, this was, again, back in, the dates aren't here, but this was about 74, 75. And we were doing essentially learning screenings, frequencies of correct dealing cards, uh, see, say numbers on cards. These were kind of component composites using cards with various content. And so we were doing assessments and we were seeing over time, not, not only what the frequencies were, but also, um, also what the accelerations were, which was kind of taken from the learning screening work that, um, that Harold Kunzelman and, and Eric and Og Lindsay and Carl Koenig were doing back then. And then this, I'm just gonna show it just for fun. When we, when I, historically, when I've gone in and trained people about fluency, we always have them do a whole bunch of timings. And so these are just a sample of them, but what's, what people can start to see is if we do with adults and they don't know any about this stuff, you start looking at the differences in frequencies here. So this is just a blank sheet that we always use. And one of my favorites is the last one, which is free write by fives to 300 to start over again. So five, 10, 20, you can do that really fast. You can talk to people while they're doing it. It doesn't slow them down. They're completely fluent. Then you do something that's mechanically similar, but it's writing backwards by sevens from 300. And then if you start talking to people, they get pissed off because they have a, they're not fluent and they have kind of an endurance and stability problem. So anyway, those data, I think the main ones, the main thing being, um, uh, being this data set are what I wanted to share and what Elizabeth asked me to share. So that's what I've got just for the sake probably of the other audience outside of this little group. I think those are so classic and, you know, there are, uh, you know, they had a lot of influence on educators. Uh, although yeah. educators are move, have moved away from percent correct. So that's kind of an old school thinking that teachers do percent corrects, you know, and that's just not. Is, is that true? That's, uh, not, that's not happening that much. Uh, uh, in fact, you see more teachers, teachers who have RTI going in their schools and have CBM going are, are doing more frequency. Oh, measure, yeah. But not in time. Uh, so, you know, there's other issues with educating sure. people, but we could make similar, we could make a family of these charts, <laughs> yep. you know, showing like bad nothing versus, right. uh, versus the, uh, count per minute. Um, yeah. The, the interesting, you amazing. know, my, my, my son who just graduated college, I mean, he had certainly four years of percent correct on his, you know, so it's pretty ubiquitous, but you're right. I guess that progress monitoring has made a big impact, hasn't it? Yeah. I've done two big presentations in the last month um, to two different wide varying audiences. And I've used those data both times. Yeah. I mean, it's people say, Holy cow, you know, and That's even perfect. if what Ken's saying is true that, you know, it's changing still people, for most people, it's like a blinding Absolutely. insight. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big Absolutely. deal. If you're looking for a group to replace education, just say ABA. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And what you said is just as relevant to this community as just not paying attention to the lessons yeah. that you've shared. 
Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. Well, my yeah. favorite on that one, um, Jim Pollard, my old student in Proje, you know, when he used to be doing this stuff, he would talk about, you know, like eight out of 10 steps, right, on a, on a chain skill. You know, it's like blowing your nose and the one you don't get is putting the handkerchief over your nose, you know, and it's like you start <laughs> to see the ramification of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Anyway. Uh, yeah, Donnie likes to use the, because uh, I can't agree with uh, uh, Rick's comment there more. And so those data, you know, anytime I'm teaching a class on the use of the standard acceleration chart, I include those data. Um, and uh, Donnie, I have to credit for these, but he has, you know, two little things he uses about how we don't live in an 80% correct world. And uh, one of them is, you know, if, you, uh, if you're 80% correct at getting dressed, then you're either missing 20% of your clothes on any given day or your one pants. out of five days per week, you're totally naked and neither work very well. Um, <laughs> I literally quoted Donnie, because uh, I, I, I loved it when I saw him give that talk the first time. I literally quoted him on that yesterday, speaking to an intervention specialist that we're working with, saying... 80% of wearing your pants to work won't cut it, right? And she was yeah. like, oh, yeah. And I was yeah. talking about it just yesterday. That's great. That brought yeah. that up. Or stopping yeah. at stop signs. So if you're 80% correct at stopping at stop signs, you're dead or in jail by the end of the day. So <laughs> I, I, I usually do that when we're talking with people who work with adolescents or adults with significant disabilities. It's, oh, you want the kid to cross the street 80% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's both heartening and really depressing to notice that those data I just showed you are 45 years old. It's a little bit like institutional racism when you see, you know, the signs from 1960 that said, you know, stop, police are killing us. You know, it's the same thing. You say, well, will it ever change? But I guess we're the ones that are going to change it. If... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Powerful data, Carl. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, absolutely. Powerful. Yeah. Thank you, B. Barrett, for that. And, you know, and I know we've been going, I know we went a little over and I, I appreciate everyone's attention. I, I, I hope I can, can I share one more chart? I mean, kind of like off the record kind of thing. I just want to share, <laughs> is that okay? If we just, five minutes, <laughs> I just wanted to share one more. Um, only because this is a family, this is a parent training, um, a, a parent running the programs with her son who's, who's 10 years old on the spectrum and this is, we channel wrap everything for this, for this parent, right? Um, we don't get into the home every day. We're, we're doing Zoom with her, but we just channel wrap this idea of animals. And this is a C-match chart. And I wanted to point out just how cool it is that the mom is making the decisions here, right? And so the C-match, we have a, in a field of four, we have our aim written here on the chart. And you can see the slices. The first slice was dog, lion, cat, and frog. And we started it at just six seconds, right? And we see this, this data point moving. It's, it's right at aim. So then she's like, well, let's go to 10 seconds and let's see if it holds. And this, this kind of speaks to what Andrew was talking a little bit about building endurance, right? And then we went to 15 seconds and 20 and 30. And then here we have this stability check, right? doing what Carl just talked about by kind of backwards by seven, right? Can, can this learner still continue to see match these animals in the field while his favorite video is playing on the iPad, right? Then we get to that minute long endurance check. And what's cool is that he passed those and we went on to slice two, which is fish, horse, cow, and elephant. But you'll notice she brought it in at 10 seconds instead of starting at the six, right? So here we have this long, this, this long fluency to get slice one. But then look at her move through the, the floor so much faster on slice two, right? Yeah. And then look at slice three, what happens? She brings yeah. it in at 20 seconds, and it's even shorter, right? And it just continues this way. And I just think it just shows how you can make really fast instructional decisions and train a parent how to do it, right? And see it, just this visual representation made all the difference. For this parent. She even skipped a four here. She even skipped 20 to 30. Wasn't discouraged that the point dropped, right? And she stuck with it and it stayed up. So that's awesome. That's it. Oh, great. Very cool. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share that. And thank you for all of your knowledge. And it was just so beautiful to have all of you here. I oh my gosh, it's been the highlight of my week. <laughs> that, is, that is a lot great. of fun. 
This Great is yeah. to see everyone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. really. Thank you for pulling it together. This is beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for yeah. making time. Thank you, um, Elizabeth and Jonathan. Thanks for organizing and orchestrating. This is really, really fun. Yeah, it's great. Thank Absolutely. you, everyone. It's really special. <laughs> yeah, anytime you want to do this again, count me in.